You know what? We still have that mug full of two-year-old candy corn. It's not full. It's got like two candy corn pumpkins in it <laughs> from a year and a half ago. Oh, my God. What are you going to do? Nobody wants to eat them. I bet they would still taste exactly the same. Probably. You're there. right. It's not two years. A year and a half. Yeah. Year, year, year and a half. Yeah. Whatever. Two years by the calendar yeah. year. 2021? Was that when that happened? 2022. 22, yeah. It's 2024 now. Oh, my gosh. I guess it is. Happy New Year, Brian. You too, Drew. Thank you. Well, we got to save it for the... Well, I guess this isn't the pre-roll, huh? Oh, yeah. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get it. Let's do it. Let's, let's do get, the... Let's, let's do the... Let's get in color. Okay. Yeah. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 118 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I'm Brian Goulet. And I am Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about the Pilot Falcon and their soft nibs, sort of a mini deep dive, maybe like a, maybe like a snorkeling or a free dive, not quite scuba. But yeah, we'll see. There. Uh, good ways to transport the Kakimori dip nib. We will do a scuba level deep dive on what makes nibs feel different from one another, even if they're the same nib size. It depends on which body part you're touching it with. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, sh yeah, sure. That's one factor. We'll, Is that we'll, not how you we'll interpreted the question? That. We'll explore that. Um, I took it in a different way, but you know. Oh. It's okay. We can. Well, that's weird. Yeah, I know. It is oh, weird. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, pens that seal great with minimal complication. We'll explain that one. Uh, good pens for heavy handed writers new to the fountain pen hobby. So if your hands are large and they weigh a lot. Yes. This is what yes. we're going to be covering. Exactly. No judgment. Um, we'll be spotlighting the ever famed Pilot Varsity, which we've talked about a ton, but never really shown. And I'm going to rip one apart and eyedropper convert it tools will be involved. It'll be exciting. I hope this works better than the time I've, we tried to I've I dropped for fingers. the Explorer. It will go better than that. Yes. Uh, and we're going to discuss our New Year's resolutions and what we did for New Year's. Are because we? Because it's 2024 now. What the heck? I didn't make, when I did this I happen? have a rev resolution ready. I'm going to make you come up with one oh, on the spot. Yikes. All right. Um, well, let's start it off with some feedback, shall we? All right. My friend Raven the Light says, I am so thankful for the pencast this week. I work for Waffle House, and this is the busiest time of year for us. I don't really get to spend time with my hmm. family during the actual holidays, so I'm grateful to have you guys, uh, I'm grateful that you gave us the time with you this week. I may not have gotten to see my family, but I've gotten to see my pen friends. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys. I truly appreciate and needed this. Raven, thank you. Obviously, that is an extraordinarily heartwarming comment and the fact that we can even if even half of that is true we're immensely flattered honored and everything in between but man waffle house on the holidays i went week before last and yeah. as always i loved it i'm a huge fan of waffle house mm -hmm. i go there any chance i get and i just paid attention to how the ordering works at waffle house oh it's like a whole thing it's amazing like you yeah. just you they just say the words while the chef is working and what i paid attention to this time was the gaps in between when the server was saying different orders to the chef like they're working they're just inputting this into their brain mm. and logging it somehow but they were very intentional about like how what sort of pauses to have in between telling the chef what's coming next mm. and it, I don't. I still don't know how it works. I'm immensely fascinated and impressed. And uh, have you ever seen a Waffle House training video? No. They have them online. It's like a whole thing. There's like shorthand lingo for like everything. It's all. It's it's very systematized. And yeah. Very specific. It's fascinating. Yeah. I was actually. I was also there. If anybody ever says anything negative about Waffle House or how it's dirty or sticky, or whatever, I was there one time during a surprise safety ins uh, health inspection. Yeah. And they did great. They did great. Um, the only thing they got dinged on that time was that the the wooden kind of bar that they have in front of the grill mm. needed to be replaced. They said that, like the lacquer had worn off. Oh. So and you know wood you know for a health you know yeah. food, food preparation it area. Absorb and, yeah. Stuff, so yeah. that they're like this needs this needs to be replaced. But that was it. Like I was there. I was fascinated. I'm like, oh, what's gonna happen? Great. Tell you what, you know what's sticky right now is this table, because when we 
poured the oh the, the uh, <laughs> I cider, sold. The, the whatever sparkling oh. grape juice from the last video we did yeah sorry about that neither of us wiped it up and now yeah. it's like sticky and we don't, touched it like three times already. we need to clean this room we were just talking <laughs> we about do. that we we're just talking we we're like yeah our cleaning um, crew doesn't come in here because it's like a jungle of cords and lights yeah so uh we're kind of responsible for that and we we, we need to do it's better easy, it's easy to forget hey about. i got my new year's resolution hey clean hey. the pen guest room i love <laughs> at it at some point this year at some point there you go all right and then we got another <laughs> comment from hey it's ct and ct says where exactly do you post these surveys on instagram i never see them mm. favorite moments were when each time you crack each other up each time brian says it depends and the moments mm -hmm. of friendship transparency about your moods and lives and yes all the useful content about pens that keep us pen nerds loving the hobby well ct let me apologize because i do usually put the hey ask us a question for the pencast surveys on instagram stories so if you don't follow us on instagram you might not see it and even then i only post one when i need more questions because i get a ton of questions so yeah. they're pretty intermittent <clears throat> next time though i promise you i will skip instagram and post the question on the youtube communities page so keep your eye on that um, we do have a communities section of our youtube channel mm -hmm. i will post the question there and as always you can write in to uh, pencast at gouletpens.com if you ever mm -hmm. wanted to ask us something directly we'll yeah. see those as well or just leave us a comment on youtube on any video we'll yep. try to look at it too yep. yeah cool um and wendy wander seven says applause for this great pencast review applause for brian's 35 hammers and drew's hank sweatshirt <laughs> i always watch the entire pencast but sometimes i have to watch it in several segments i hope that still counts for your statistics mm -hmm. thank you so much for a wonderful pencast this year and looking forward to more in 2024. So that is interesting. And, uh, you know, I know YouTube metrics are its own little maze, but mm -hmm. it's not surprising to me that most people would probably watch a two hour video on fountain pens and nonsense in several hope, chunks. I would hope you have something more important in your life to attend to during a two hour block of time. Or watching us. if this is just their priority. I mean, you know, that, well, that you deserve even more credit for that. I honestly. have made dumber things my priority in my life, Brian, 100%. I think we all have. Yeah. I have t I have 100% prioritized something with less positive impact than this pen cast in my life. Well. Several times, well, maybe hundreds. <laughs> I don't know if I've done a hundred, but I've certainly done it. I've certainly done it. For so, sure. Well, I appreciate that. That's uh, really cool. And as far as like the metrics go, I mean, there's so many different metrics. You can slice and yeah. dice it up however you want, but... You know, basically the metrics I shared about like the average watch time, which is like 27 minutes or something like that, if I remember correctly, um, that is basically taking your, you know, if you're breaking it up and watching it in four different segments, it's counting, counting each time you watch it as a separate view and a separate amount of time. So I think, you know, there's probably a lot of people who are watching it in separate chunks. So if we, if we wanted to, we could pull like unique viewers and then it might track, you know, the total number of people that are watching and then we could do watch time for that but you know now honestly these are all vanity metrics yeah we it don't spend really a ton of time like we'll look at them every now and then but ultimately every time we have a conversation about youtube metrics we end up saying like eh, it doesn't really matter because really what matters are the folks in the comments that are getting value out of this talking mm -hmm. to each other answering each other's questions like that's really the goal yeah if we can sell some pens and keep the business afloat great that is obviously the goal brian's got you know it's a very important part of yeah this, like but. We're not like producing got, any one show. Right. We've got like, families we've got here that, stuff. you know, have yeah. people to feed. But the community engagement is really what the lifeblood of our, you know, channel has been. And would, we would love it to continue to be that. Absolutely. I got some feedback from Bujo and Bizu. I have to say I found the pen cast before I found your website. I was researching about fountain pens as it's my new special interest and immediately enjoyed the friendship dynamic between you guys. I now have made multiple purchases and am well down the fountain pen rabbit hole. That always amazes me that you would discover this and be like, yeah, I'm on board. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's do it. This is what I want to get into. I mean, that's really cool. It honestly. is amazing. I'm super honored by that. Yeah. But especially like last episode, we didn't talk about pens like at all. No. But we're making up for it this week. Trust me. All right. Um, let's see here. Hawk Owl Dolphin says, Happy New Year to everyone. I understand Brian perfectly. He is like a shark and can't stop swimming. That's right. Or I'll die. Downtime must be filled, but he needs order. 
Disorganized logs? No way. Wrong tool for the job? No way. <laughs> nope. I suspect writing with fountain pens is a calm moment of peace distracting from the constant need to do and order things. Just a guess. Blessings to the Goulet Pen family in the new year. Yeah, fountain pens. Writing with fountain pens is definitely a calming thing. Yeah. Because it, like, forces my thoughts to slow down and, you know, it's like an in- – like. You can have like the buzz marketing word of like a writing instrument. It's like having a watch that's a time piece. I'm like, what is that? You know, so writing instrument can sound a little bougie, but I really truly think of fountain pens as an instrument because you're engaging so much more of your brain. I mean, really writing of any kind, you could argue is doing that. But, you know, I find that doing that with fountain pens, especially I, I write at a different pace and I think about it differently than when I write with other instruments. You've so. made that comparison before, just talking from mm-hmm. a manufacturing standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the instrument analogy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's this level of like craftsmanship and intentionality and passion and all that mm-hmm. that goes into it. So yeah, very cool. I'm glad, glad you appreciate that. Um, but I will say I have plenty of disorganized logs as well. I'm not <laughs> afraid to leave a project half done. Um, in fact, I have piles of dirt that I are left over from the log graves that I've built. So, you know, you stick logs in there and then you have extra dirt because you've displaced all that dirt with logs and now i just have piles of dirt back there along with piles of chipped up mulch and stuff like that it looks like a construction site in my backyard but you know rachel doesn't complain she puts up with a lot with me so now i have dirt whenever i need it you never know when you need dirt i haven't needed dirt (laughs) in a couple years i have (laughs) mainly because of the other projects that i've done anyway hills 214 says, Brian, as much as I love all the log grave... Oh, I didn't realize. The next comment is about log graves. Okay, Brian, as much as I love all the log grave stories, have you considered using them to make a small cabin as a just-for-fun project? I have considered that. However, it's not the right type of wood. Oh. It's like most of the logs that I'm taking down are trees that are basically dead standing trees that are filled with, like, bugs and stuff like that so it's not structurally very sound and they're mostly crappy southern yellow pine that would degrade very quickly uh, and would not be structurally sound Mm. so as appealing as that would be um i would have to cut like healthier trees down to do that and that's not what i'm going for because i have enough trees to deal with that are dead yeah i'm taken down so yeah unfortunately the trees that i am taking down have literally no value to anyone except bugs so I will give them back to Mother Earth. Um, and last question. Oh my gosh, it's another one about log graves. Okay, Jerry <laughs> Whit- Jerry Whitville. Sorry. Says, how many log graves make a cemetery? Brian's log cemetery. I had to include this one. That, that's like a, a that's dad, a dad joke. That's a it. really well. Yeah. I mean, we call them graves, but we've called them. You've have, you have two graves now. I got two plots back so there now. When does like? Do you need a third one for it to become a cemetery? I don't know. I feel like I need to like fence it off or do like <laughs> put some flowers on it or something. I'll call it a memorial garden. There we go. That? That's, yeah. That's when it more. starts growing fungus. Yeah. Cemetery's got such a like kind of a connotation, like a vibe to it. I just just yeah. lean into it. I do say I will say that whenever I pass like a cemetery when I'm driving with my kids, I'm like, you see. See that cemetery there? People are dying to get in there. That's like one of my one of my go-tos. I've done it so many times now, it's at the point where I don't even have to say it. We just drive by a cemetery and the kids are like, Ugh, okay, dad. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, yes. Well That's done. when I know I'm in their head. I've traumatized them. Excellent. <laughs> yep. Okay. All right. All right. That's it for uh that's it for what are we doing? Feedback. Um new stuff. Drew, do we have new stuff? We have new stuff. We do. We do. I forgot to write it down. That's okay. We're going to talk about new stuff. All right. So it's the start of the year. Not a whole ton of stuff usually launches in January, but um, there are some things. So definitely check out the new arrivals and the coming soon. Um, We'll probably have more on the coming soon than the new arrivals. But uh, we do have a couple things. We have the Visconti Medici Briarwood. We have this in yellow gold trim as well as ruthenium. This is their acrosilk material. So it's sort of like a part celluloid, part resin type of thing. It's not like a full nitrocelluloid, but it's got some cellulosic properties to it. Um, but it just looks like a very, I mean, basically you can consider it resin. Um, but it it almost looks like it might be made out of wood. It's not. Yeah, especially this one. It, yeah. They're definitely going for a more wood. Because this one, like yeah. they've had the Acrosilk on the Medici before, yeah. but it was very glossy. Yeah. This one, they're leaving it a little matte. So it, had, mm-hmm. it, it almost feels woody too. 
Yeah. It's, it's really a, cool. It's got an interesting texture to it, but the swirl pattern is beautiful. Um, it's got more depth to it. I mean, I, the pictures come across pretty well, um, but it's one of those when you like turn it in the light, you know, it glitters and shimmers and stuff. It looks really, it looks really good. Um, but what's kind of interesting about these ones is it's got uh, something different going on with the center band. Mm -hmm. So the center band's got this like Fleur de Lis uh, kind of like overlay over top of a clear ink window on the center band. So that's pretty neat. I mean, they've done some like Homo sapiens that have had those clear uh, kind of center bands, but I've never seen an overlay over the clear center band. So that's kind of new. The only time I've seen that was on the uh, the Divina. Um, oh, okay. My Divina has one like that. Oh, it does? Like yeah. the special ones? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. But it's rare. That was like 12 years ago or something years crazy. Ago. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of neat. So um, it's worth checking out. 876 for that pen. So it's, it's up there, but it is pretty cool. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think that's all I got. Yeah. They're also, we've also got a new Monteverde Ritma. So the Ritma is the Monteverde mm -hmm. that has that very kind of cylindrical profile with the snappy magnetic cap. They have come out with the 2024 special edition, which they've done in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. The olive one, I think mm -hmm. maybe there was an orange one as well. Uh, as yeah, a special edition. Was that a special edition? Yeah, I guess so. Something like that. But now it's going to be the Espresso, which is a lovely, it looks really lovely good. brown. It looks really good. It honestly. does. Even the packaging looks good. Like literally when Glenn was doing the photo shoot, um, we grabbed our little Nespresso machine and we're like, we're doing up like an actual oh, cool. Nespresso to the photo with it. And I grabbed, I think it was like a Starbucks Nespresso pod, like the box like almost matched the packaging. It even had like the beans on it and everything. And I was like, wow, they really nailed the design yeah. of this, uh, the box. So it's pretty cool. It feels yeah. kind of special. And it's a good price. Yovo black nib and it's $40. And it, right now it comes with a free bottle of Monteverde Blue Skies Ink. Yeah. So kind of a good deal. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah. that is available now. Sweet. Uh, so that's it for new stuff right now. Um, and we'll just jump right into the Q and A because let me tell you, we got some, we got some A's. All right, our first question comes to us from John D. Mm -hmm. And John, I, 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 I hear John D and I can't help but think, think like- Rockefeller. Yes! Yeah. Because I, I listen to NPR, you yeah. know, it's brought John to you by D. the John and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. So John D says, in some previous pen cast, the Pilot Falcon has been mentioned as well as the Falcon nib and the availability of that nib on some other specific Pilot pens. On your website, the Pilot Falcon nib options are soft, mm -hmm. extra fine, fine and soft medium. On the Pilot mm -hmm. Custom Heritage and the Custom 743, there are like soft, fine, but then also Falcon. Yep. The Falcon nib isn't listed on its namesake pen. Nope. But on the soft, but only on the soft nib options. But the Falcon nib is a choice on the 912 and the 743. Yes, it's confusing. There have been some posts on the <laughs> pens and nibs on other pen lines, but I could not find Pilot. Could you describe the similarities and differences on the Falcon slash soft nibs available on Pilot pens? Yes, so this is my maybe like free diving deep dive, you know? So we're taking a deep breath and going down, but we're not gonna stay down there for an like inhumane amount of time. All right, so- Thank it's, you. It's, you're welcome. Because that's coming, that's coming next. Um, I take it back. It's so confusing. I totally understand that. Um, so uh, let's think of this like three different types of nibs that we're really comparing. We have the Pilot Falcon nibs, which is the Pilot Falcon pen that has that like beak nib. That's one type of nib. The pen is called the Falcon, so technically that nib is also the Falcon nib, but it is not the same as the FA nib which is also called the Falcon nib. That's what you see on the 743. That's what you see on uh, various other pens, the 912. Um, totally different nibs. And then you have the soft nibs, which it's, it's confusing, but those are basically regular pilot nibs that have softness added to them or whatever, taken away, whatever it is. They're made softer. So it is confusing, but hopefully I can clear that up here for you right now. Okay, so Pilot Falcon, distinctly different than the FA, and don't even think about them as the same nib, even though they're named the same thing. It's confusing, I get it, but just, I'll just call it Falcon and FA, just so that we don't have any confusion there. Falcon being the one <clears throat> on the Falcon. Yes, to further confuse things, in Japan, they make the Pilot Falcon pen with that beak nib, 
they make it in both a hard and a soft version. What we sell is the soft version. That's the only thing available in and the US. And it's not called the Falcon over there, is it? I don't know what it's called over there. Isn't it the Ilabo? It might be the Ilabo. Like basically every pen has a different yeah. name over there. I think it might be the Ilabo. I don't know what Ilabo means. I don't know what it means either. But, either way. Okay. But they still put FA on the other nibs though, which is interesting. Uh, yeah, because I guess the other nibs are called Falcon. Maybe Ilabo means Falcon in some other language. Anyway, I'm, does I'm, I'm deviating your deep dive. Please yes. don't let me do that. Yeah, you're, you're. I'm so sorry. You're tugging at me underwater, Drew. Um, <laughs> okay, so yes, I don't understand. I don't know the Ilabo thing, but yeah. So Pilot Falcon, US, all soft nibs. So that nib has got the beak thing. It's unique in its own thing. It's only offered on that pen, but they are soft nibs. But I, from what I understand, you know, you can't have a soft nib without having something harder because otherwise it's just, it's not soft. It's just as what soft it is. Soft compared to what, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's my understanding. I've never actually used a hard Falcon nib, but I assume they exist. I've never really seen them or whatever. Maybe it's on the Alabo you can get a hard nib. Gosh, that kind of makes me want one now because I need to experience it. But I've used hard and soft nibs on every other Pilot pen. So I can imagine what the difference would be between the two. So just know that when you're looking at the Pilot Falcon in the US, you're, that's a soft nib. You're using a soft nib. Um, the shape of the nib itself, yes, it's unique, but essentially it's going to perform similar to any other Pilot soft nib. So if that helps, taking the whole Falcon nameology out of it, on the Falcon, you're using a Pilot soft nib. So if you're looking at a 743 or a 912, just know that even though it's a different nib design, you're essentially going to get a similar kind of result um, between those. I'm finding plenty of Ilabos, and it is the Ilabo is the Falcon. Okay. But I can't find anything without a soft nib. Really? I mean, just in the, you know, 30 in seconds. The, yeah. That's a, okay. Well, audience, you tell us, have you ever used or heard of a non-soft Ilabo or Falcon? I'm just realizing now I've never like come across one before, but I've never like really looked, sought it out that hard. Anyway, um, this is the thing where it's like, we know the products that we have pretty well, but they're with every brand, there are things that aren't available in the US that we essentially know very little more about than you all do. We just kind of hear about them and we can maybe ask our distributor and ask for some information, but because it's not something really available, we don't necessarily get more information than you all do. Anyway, um, so, Pilot Falcons in the US, all soft nibs. Um, now the FA nib, let's talk about that. So that nib is really the weird one of the group here because it's kind of its own unique thing. And in, I don't know, in my experience, they're slightly different, but essentially they're, they're kind of the same. They're slightly different between like the 743 and the 912. Oh, you're good, this oh. is done. Oh. We're charging up some batteries. It's We've weird. had some issues with our battery chargers like beeping incessantly. So if you hear little beeps here and there and us getting skittish about it. I thought it was going to keep on going. No, it's green. It's Great. good. They're charged. It's batteries for these lights. FYI. There you go. Behind the scenes. It takes a lot to make this thing happen. Super anyway. annoying. Um, okay. So FA nib. This is the one to me that is like very different than the others, in my opinion. The FA nib on the what? Either one. Oh, okay, yeah. The only ones that I've used, I don't know if there are other FA nibs out there, but the only ones that we have in the US is the 743 and the Custom 912, right? Am I yeah, mistaken there, about there that? There might be one on the 742, which is not imported into the US. But that's I, the same as the 743, right? No. What's different about I it? think the 742, I'm stepping outside of my knowledge zone here. I think the 742 might be the same as the 912. Really? Dang it, this battery. Yeah. Oh, the other one just finished. Oh, God. <laughs> Jeez. There's literally nothing wrong. They're just done charging. That's so weird. <laughs> and odd. Yeah, they both just finished. They're both green now. Anyway. I wonder why they finished so quickly. Hmm? Sorry, y'all. Here we are. Okay. Um, yeah, 742 and 743. I don't even know if there's one on the 742. I could be wrong. But okay. I think that that mid-size, because you go from the 74 mm -hmm. in nib size and the, the actual shape of the nib right. to then the 912 right. to then the 843 slash 743 size. Yeah. The 912 is that in-between nib size. I think it's like a uh, eight, I believe. Huh. But, so I don't know. Okay. I, I haven't, uh, 
I'd have to check. Pilot has their own whole thing going on with yeah. nib sizes and all that kind of stuff. It gets very confusing. In fact, I'll be working on producing videos on these very soon, and I clearly have more research to do before I do so. Um, but either way, the FA nib essentially um, is considered like a flex nib, more or less. Um, it is, I would, I would call it, you know, basically a slightly more soft nib than the pilot soft nibs. Um, you're essentially trying to get line variation with it. Um, but it's just interesting because the way that it's ground, you know, it's meant to be held a little more upright. It's not the same as a flex nib like you might have on like a noodler's pen or a Yovo flex. It's not meant so much as like a Western flex. It's meant more of a, you know, Japanese flex, which, you know, you're, typically dealing with shorter characters and stuff. You're not dealing with like long flowing, you know, cursive script so much. Um, so it's just the way that you use those nibs um, for flex purposes is a little bit different than you might use on other flex pens. Okay, so the 742 does have an FA available. In, okay. It is the uh, number 10 size. So the okay. 743 is the number 15. Right. So and I guess the, 10 is the size that is on this, the, the 912. Cut, that's on the 912 is the number 10. Yeah. yeah. And then on the 740, uh, sorry, the 74, the 74 is, is a, eight. a No, it's number five. Is it number five? Yep. So what's the Stargazer then? Stargazer is a number three, I think. Stargazer is tiny. I think it might be opposite though. I think it's a tinier nib, but I think the number might be higher. What, on the Stargazer? Yeah. No, I don't no, think so. No, okay, anyway. I don't think so. It's I think it's a number, th I think it's number but three. Yeah, so there is a smaller, yeah, so there is another one, but it, should be okay. the same size as the 912. Okay. Yeah. There you go. So basically, it's the same nib. Okay. That is weird, though, that the 742 has the same size nib as the 912, but the 743 is bigger. It's all very confusing, guys. I'm so sorry. Um, but we're, we're doing our best here to try to explain it, especially because, like, not all of these are available in the U.S., so we're really scrapping together some info here. Um, but anyway, so think of the FA nib that you can get in the U.S. on the custom 912 and the custom 743, Think of those as more of the like flex pens. I don't, you know, I, I don't know that I would necessarily truly call them flex pens, but you're that's that's essentially why you would get these nibs is because you want to get some line variation. Um, you can still get some line variation with the regular soft nibs with any of Pilot's pens, um, but it's not going to be as soft as the FA nibs. So um, I'll give you a breakdown just of what is offered, at least what we have on our site right now. Um, just so you can get somewhat of a breakdown. So the soft nibs on pilot pens that we have, we have the pilot Falcon and the metal Falcon. Those are only offered with soft nibs. So whatever nib size you get, I think it's extra fine, fine and medium on those. There's also a broad, but we dropped that a long time ago. I don't even know if they're brought in the US anymore. Um, the custom heritage 912, that's got a soft, fine, fine, medium and a medium. It also has the FA, but it has the regular soft versions of the fine, fine, medium and medium. The custom 743 currently doesn't have the soft nibs, but it's coming. Those are going to be coming, I think, in January, like soon. So we'll have that in soft, fine, fine, medium, and medium, just like we have on the 912s. Um, but those will be slightly larger nibs for what that's worth. And on the 743, there's also the FA nib as well. And then the oddball out there, the Pilot Justice 95. That is also a soft nib, but it's got a little, like, pressure bar that you can put over it to harden it up to varying degrees. So the Justice 95 is its own whole thing, but that is a technically a soft nib on that pen as well. Um, so you can throw that in there. We have the soft fine version. I believe there's also a soft medium, but we only have the soft fine because that's the only one that sold well for us. So, um, okay. You were um, right about the Stargazer. It's a three. A three. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm always, I always so proud of myself when I remember a I always random thought it was fact an eight. like that. I had to zoom in because it looks like an eight. Oh, maybe that's, it's a, it just looks yeah. like an eight. I, I, you know, I wrote down in my notes that it was an eight, but then you look closely like, nope, it's not closed off. Mm, it's a three. There you go. Awesome. Um, okay. So here's the TLDR, which is too late. <laughs> Have you ever seen the movie Clue? Like when he's summarizing? It's like. It's been a while know, since I've seen Clue. You should see it again. It's good. It holds up. Cool. Um, anyway. Uh, so the Pilot Falcon, if I had to summarize the pens, the actual pen Pilot Falcon, it's reliable. It's a very affordable pen. It's got softness and some line variation. I would say it's the best option to go for if you're unsure that maybe if you're like a Pilot soft nib, um, but it's a great pen all around. And because it's the most affordable of all these options, it is the safest bet to go for. So if you've never used a soft or flex nib, Pilot Falcon is an easy one 
to to recommend and like before like tr like more flex nibs like specifically designed and marketed flex nibs were out the pilot falcon was like the standard for modern you know flex whatever and if you if you got it modified you know it could be it can do some of the things that you'd see on crazy yeah. youtube videos sure but just as it is it's a soft nib you get some line variation um so the pilot soft nibs on the other pens um those are going to be great if you know you like those other pen models so you know the pilot falcon it's a slightly shorter pen it's very light pen very. um and so that's not some people really love that some people maybe not as much or just the beak nib if that weirds you out but you know you like the design of say the 912 or the 743 then you can get a soft nib on those pens and the performance will be very similar to what you're getting on the falcon um, but you still get some of that very bouncy feel if you don't want to truly get line variation, you just don't press as hard. You'll still get a lot of bounce while you write. I consider Pilot's gold nibs to be pretty bouncy anyway, just yeah. even the hard ones. Um, but the soft ones are even more so, um, as opposed to like, say, if you have like platinum nibs, for example, they're very stiff. The soft nibs, to me, on a platinum feel like a regular Pilot nib. Yes. So just in case you're familiar with those at all, you can get somewhat of a gauge. Um, so yeah, if you like those pen models, those are gonna be more expensive than a Falcon. But if you really like the heftier pens, the larger models, the design of it, whatever, um, I would definitely easily recommend a softer nib on those if you know you want more of that kind of bouncy feel. Um, the FA nib, that's, that's a slightly tougher one for me to recommend for everybody. I would say you should consider that nib more like a flex nib where it's not going to be like anybody can just pick it up and write with it, have a great experience. It's one that's going to require a little bit of experimentation. You're going to have to test your hand and your, you know, if you got a really low pen angle, you're not going to love that, that nib quite as much. Now I will say, I can't explain why, but the slightly larger one on the 743, I have a whole, I have a low pen angle. I have a heavier hand. I have better luck writing with that one than I do on the number 10 nib that comes on the nine, the custom 912, if we're talking the FA nib specifically. Yeah. For whatever reason, it just works a little better for me. I think it's the same for you, for you right? Um, like, do you have better luck with a 743 yes, FA nib? Yes, okay. I did. Well, you know what? Um, yes. Have you, have you gotten used to both? or? I've gotten used to both, but out of the box, I definitely had Im immediate success with the 743, okay. where the 912, I had to get used to it. Okay. I so, feel feel like the 912 requires a little bit more experimentation on, okay. the, on the position. But I don't know why that would be. I mean, the nibs are slightly different sizes. I don't know if that matters or if it's just the way they're ground, whatever, but yeah. that's been my experience. Um, but certainly plenty of people get both and they enjoy them and stuff like that. Um, we don't get as many people that are like buying these FA nibs and like having trouble getting them to work like most other flex mm -hmm. pens. So it's not quite as finicky as a flex pen but it's a little more than just a soft nib. Yeah, requires some more intentionality. Yeah, um, so I would consider it more of like an advanced nib. So if you've already used some flex nibs, some soft nibs, and you know you wanna go just a little bit further, the FA nib might be worth checking out. So I know that's a lot to take in. It would definitely help to show this close up in writing, which we can't really do very easily on the pencast here. Maybe we will on yeah, another video. As I was, as I was kind of, trying to talk about this, I was like, I'm having a hard time explaining some of this in words because we're not able to actually show it in writing. That would actually be pretty helpful. So I think I'm gonna kind of take this concept and flesh it out a little bit more and maybe look to do a more of a full video on this if uh, y'all think that's interesting. So the pilot nibs are all so confusing. It's definitely something I think could be done in a we definitely have established that. If anything yes. else, we've established that. But uh, there's de uh, we, we debated internally of like, how would we make this simpler and like make we, a video to break it down, but how can also we make it comprehensive, but not yeah. confusing. Yes, that would be the challenge. Yeah. So I'm up for the challenge, but we'll see. We'll see. I'm not, it's not gonna happen right away, but I'll work on it. So anyway, yeah, that's what I got for that one. Mini deep dive. Uh, Drew, are you ready to do some talking? Now? Bring it. All right, Jonathan asks, I found out about the Kakamori dip pens from the Pencasts, and I've been loving mine, but I'm looking for a good way to travel with it. The nib holder is just long enough that I've been having trouble finding a pen sleeve that'll fit it. Any recommendations, shorter nib holders, cases that'll fit an ink sample alongside the pen case, since you need ink with you, 
What do you think, Drew? Not a shorter nib holder. That's the opposite of what you need to do. What you need to do, Jonathan. You need a longer nib holder? A longer, a much, much, much mm. longer nib holder. That you can use as a cane, perhaps. No. No? Think okay. track and field, my friend. Oh, like a javelin? There we All go. Right. This one's okay. this one's smart. Okay. <laughs> you got a nice running start. You find out I mean where you're traveling, obviously. You gotta pin, oh. pinpoint that. Okay. Get your latitudes and longitudes and you mm. chuck that bad boy to wherever okay. you uh need to go as long as you're traveling you know within a if couple you're hundred if yards. you're really accurate you can use it to save your parking spot mm. um <clears throat> because i'm not going to pull into a place with a javelin embedded in the asphalt or embedded in your neck if you're trying to take out the whoa person that's going for your whoa spot, you know? whoa that's aggressive <laughs> no one thing you can do that is like the short answer that i would say take the nib off and if you take the removable very easily removable nib off of the nib holder that stick will fit in just about any pen case, especially if you might not mm. be able to like fit it in with the pens. You might need to like shove it over to where the zipper is or in the spine, mm. but you can usually get it in there. Um, if you wanted to actually fit it in a case, my recommendation nib on would be the rickshaw gear pouch. It's not exactly a pen case, but Jonathan in this case was thinking about bringing other things with them. Uh, such as ink samples, the rickshaw gear pouch does have the royal plush lining. It's beautiful. It is a great catch-all for any sort of random accessory you want to bring with you. It does fit the Kakamori nib and the nib holder, as well as a slightly longer nib holder. The, the one I use is not the stock, is not the one we sell. It's just one that, that I got from a pen show at the Gourmet Pens, you know, uh, uh, class, and it fits that too. So more than enough room in the rickshaw gear pouch and then plenty of room for additional ink samples as well. If you wanted to throw mm -hmm. in a, you know, a uh, uh, ink miser, you could throw that into the gear pouch as well. So mm -hmm. I heavily recommend the rickshaw gear pouch. It's not a product that we talk about a lot mm -hmm. because it's not like a specific, you know, bullseye for any one product because it's kind of a catch all, but that's what it's mm -hmm. supposed to be. It's supposed to be there for you when you need something like this, that's a little off the beaten path. So definitely grab one of those. It's not expensive. And eventually, I promise you, you will find a use for it eventually. Hang on to it long enough, it'll come in handy. In addition to that, um, you can also, and it's another product I don't talk a lot about, is the Punilabo pen cases. Oh, yeah. Brian, we talked about them when they were new, but we don't mm -hmm. revisit them. That's a nice longer pen pouch. Now, you will have to take the nib off of the nib holder for storage in that. But again, great for a catch-all. You can toss in a bunch of ink samples. Mm -hmm. You can toss in an ink miser into your Punalabo pen case, and it's a great travel companion for your dip needs. And so even if it's extended, because that one you can like push it up or you can extend even if it extended, out, yeah, I checked. Fit with I checked. It would, like, yeah, it just looked like the nib holder itself, just the wood part, is seven inches long. Yeah. So and the nib is what probably an inch or so. About that, yeah. So yeah, eight inches. That's getting. It's yeah. getting up there. Yeah, so it will. Seven inches. You is could probably it pen get it in a Punalabo pen case, but whatever animal you're going to have is going to have a it's protuberance. Gonna get, it's going to get speared with yeah. the nib because that's a sharp it nib is. holder too. Yeah, or the sharp. So nib, you can turn your cat into a catacorn, um, <laughs> but uh, or yeah. a corgacorn. <laughs> if you pick a corgi, <laughs> um, and then um. finally. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate that sample vials are a great idea and the ink miser, the um, stand up ink miser, yeah. not the ink, ink shot, the actual um, mm. ink miser. Uh, inkwell, I think it's called. Inkwell, yeah. yeah. So that's a great accessory for dipping and playing with your inks because while the uh, Kakamori dip nib is just fine for samples, putting an ink miser in there makes it even more easy. So yeah, yeah I would say gear pouch number one, Take the nib off, number two. There you go. I have nothing to add. You Boosh. covered it perfectly. <clears throat> All right, Drew. All right, we've got a question to, here from- Did you go scuba dive in here? No, not at all. Let's do it. I've got plenty of coffee though, so let's go. <laughs> um, so love him or hate him, Dr. Uh, not doctor, <laughs> D. Eric Ortega. Your first name is Dr. Eric, I'm sorry. Um, D. Eric Ortega says, I've been super lucky this season and have received my first Sailor Pro Gear, my first Platinum Century, along with several other nice pens. Um, my question related to that is why do different brands with similar nib sizes, which he got a medium fine and a, and a ultra extra fine, 
Mm -hmm. um, my question related to that is why do different brands with similar nib size slash line widths feel different when it comes to feedback? Mm. I understand that a fine will give a, give more feedback than a broad, but why would a sailor give more of a feedback than a pilot with a very similar nib tip size and gold carrots, example, uh, such as 14K? What causes the difference in the feeling? Mm. P.S., and this is where we can either love or hate Eric here. Mm -hmm. P.S. I'm good with a deep dive. I can discuss the differences between a worker placement game versus an action selection game for hours. I could discuss the differences between a Japanese laminated chisel versus an American solid steel chisel for as long. Mm. You're in good company, Eric. I could talk about the chisels. Because 50% of us could talk about <laughs> chisels with you. <laughs> What's the game one? Do you know what that is? Is that like, is that like a board game I reference don't know. there? Yeah. Worker, worker placement, placement game. game. I don't know. I think it, it feels like a board game reference. Yeah, to it me. does sound like it. Because that's like there's there's depth to that too. Yeah. So if Adrian and Brian were here, you'd have a great oh, time. Oh yeah. Definitely. Unfortunately, Drew gonna, Drew's gonna play wet blanket and just kind of wait wait out the timer. You're on not this like one. a board gamer. Really? Uh, no, not at all. Interesting. I usually can't stand board games. I can't stand any game where I have to wait my turn. Oh. I can't do that. That's you why. Just... That's also why I can't like watch team sports. I don't have the patience for it. It's like you play a little bit and you wait. You watch the replay, and you watch some commercials, and you mm. wait. I'm like, no, I'm done. Mm -mm. You just want to... Can't handle it. just want it continuous. I, it's not a want. It's a, I can't... <laughs> I just can't stay engaged. Mm. I yeah. literally can't. Now, I've yeah. heard that Settlers is a game where every player is consistently involved throughout yeah. the entire game. So, yeah, because you can trade every turn. So I've never and, yeah. played that. That... I might be able to do, but a game like Scrabble or anything that takes turns where you're just Gosh. waiting for somebody else, like Scrabble's torture. No, I can't. I'm not doing it. Yeah. I can't. Or e even Monopoly. like, no, even like poker. I'm like, you do your thing and you wait. And I'm mm. like, uh, <laughs> I can't. I can't. That's why I like MMA. Does nothing stops and something could mm. end in the blink of an eye. Yeah. No matter maybe. what, if team if guy A is way better than guy B, then it's over quickly. Mm. Football, if Team A is way better than Team B. Doesn't matter. You still have to suffer for three hours while Team A completely decimates Team B. Doesn't matter. Yeah, you're still there because okay. we got a we got the advertisers. They sold, we that, pay. They sold that ad time. Yeah, they're, they're milking it. Can't do it. That's right. Call all those timeouts. Yep. Draw it out. Mm. Yep. Um, I'm not a big sports person either, so Damn. I feel you on that one. But um, anyway, I digress. <laughs> this answer is going to be long enough as it is. All right. Challenge accepted, Eric. Um, so this is, a, this I will say, this is gonna be a little less of like a technical deep dive. So I didn't so much like go researching and look at like formulas. I kind of feel like I could answer this in like one that. sentence. I'm wondering like where- Yeah, where, you could, where you <laughs> I wonder where you went um, with this. I, I'm, I'm gonna try to keep you all engaged and not bore you too much. I'm gonna, Drew's gonna be my gauge for how well I do there. <laughs> okay, so there, I think there's two overarching factors that will impact your nibs feel, okay? This is all, I've just made all this up. So if it's terrible, then blame me. I'm, I've just like drew it upon my own head and organized these things. Not to say like I deserve credit for all of this, but I deserve any blame for if the, what I'm about to say doesn't make any sense. Okay, so there are two overarching factors that will impact your nibs feel. And I would call that the stiffness of the nib and then the grinding on the tip, okay? So I'll break each of these down a little bit because there's multiple factors that go into each of these, but those are the two main overarching factors if I had to say what influences the feel of feedback. So specifically related to the nib, you get into paper, you get into all other factors too, the ink, but just talking about the nib. So stiffness of the nib. So basically the stiffer the nib, the less it's gonna deflect as you press on it and the more that you'll feel the paper. It's like if you have stiffer shocks on your car, you're gonna feel the road more, right? Um, it's mostly gonna be a preference thing. There's no universal right or wrong uh, with stiffness. So manufacturers can basically make whatever they want and it might even vary depending on pen, depending on nib. Um, so there are some factors that go into the stiffness of a nib and I'll break those down. Um, the overall design of the nib, which is gonna include its overall length, its shape, maybe curvature, or like overall shape, like the wings, like all that stuff goes into how the nib is going to flex and bend and all that kind of stuff, vibrate, because really the feedback is, is basically vibration that you're feeling through the nib. Um, the thickness of the nib, the taper, both the taper of the, the wings going to the tip, as well as the taper 
of the thickness. Like when you have flex nibs, part of the reasons they flex is because they're thicker at the base and they taper as it gets closer to the tip so that you get more of that flex. So depending on how much it tapers and how thick it is, that all matters. Um, so these are all things that are related more or less to the physical shape of the nib. So there are all these different ways that a nib can be shaped and designed to give a different feel and bounce and vibration, all this kind of stuff. Um, then you get into the material, which is like the steel versus gold thing that you mentioned, or like the carat weight of the gold, right? So that will obviously make a difference. If all else is equal, if you have a stainless steel nib versus a gold nib, they're gonna feel different on the page because the gold nib is gonna be slightly more bouncy. You're gonna feel a little bit more of what's going on with a steel nib um, than you will with a gold because it's sort of like the shock absorbers on the car. Um, now that said, you mentioned specifically if you've got like a 14 carat from one to another. Could very well be that there's some of these other factors, the design elements and things like that. It's probably more the case, but I will say not all carrots are created equal as well. So basically the carrot, if all else is equal, the higher carrot rating of gold, the softer it's gonna be because gold is softer than the other components of the alloy, right? So theoretically a Sailor 21 carat nib has a higher gold content, it has less other non-gold things in it than gold, right? So it's got other things like usually nickel and copper and like other things like that. Um, but you can have different alloys of gold. You can still have a 14 karat gold, but depending on what alloys are in there, you know, copper and nickel and all those things, they have their own whatever composition, their own elemental factors that depending on the composition of that gold can affect how a nib might feel. Now, could you really tell that much of a difference? I don't know. Getting into the composition of gold alloys is trade secret stuff. There's no communication from any manufacturer where they talk about how their gold is composed. If you asked here and at Magna Carta, he would probably tell you. He's the only one who's ever said anything about that yeah. because on his Mag 600, he was talking about what he had to do to get those gold yeah. nibs to He's very be transparent flexible. about his manufacturing. Yeah, it's way more complicated than you would think. Oh yeah, I, it and, was like listening to another language. Yeah, and it even gets into like, when the gold is forged and whether it's like cold forged versus hot and all this stuff that can all affect the stiffness and all that. So there's a, there's a lot more factors involved. Um, okay. So the carrot, the purity of the gold does matter. You know, the higher, this, the higher the gold content, softer it'll be. Okay. Composition. Okay. Sorry. I'm just catching up on my own notes. Um, that can all impact its softness. Okay. Uh, different aspects of the shape of the design of the nib will impact its softness as well as the softness of the material itself. And there's an overlap of their impact, which is wonderful because it makes it nice and confusing so that if you have two nibs, you could have one essentially that's a 14 karat gold that is softer than an 18 karat gold on another pen. And you're like, well, why is that? And it's like, well, yes, technically 18 karat gold should be softer, but because of the other factors, the shape and thickness, all that kind of stuff, you know, your 14 karat might flex more. So that makes things nice and confusing. Um, so just because you have a certain carat rating of a gold doesn't mean that it's going to have a particular softness because there are so many other factors involved. It would just be that if all else of the nib was designed exactly the same, the higher the carat should be softer. Um, so example is Platinum, who normally makes rather stiff gold nibs. You know, they have 14 carat nibs. Pilots, 14 carat nibs are much softer than Platinum's. Part of that, I think, is because platinum uses thicker gold or something like that. And certainly seems that way. And stuff like that. Um, I know platinum is mentioned not a lot in their marketing material, but the amount of gold content they use for their nibs is higher than most other nibs, um, which I think plays into its hardness. Um, Would somewhat. that make it softer, though? Well, if it's thicker, if like the nib itself oh, is oh, thicker. Oh, I see, I see. You know, so it's like, <clears throat> but if it's, yeah, 14 carat there versus another 14 carat and the platinum nib is thicker, plus other elements like the design of the wings and all this type of stuff, you know, you could end up with a thicker or a, a, a harder nib. That's interesting. Why bother using more gold if it doesn't, it seems like they're just wasting money there. These are all great questions uh. that are above my pay grade. Um, mm -hmm. So choosing a nib that's made to be softer, flexible is going to be softer. We just talked about this with Pilot's nibs. They have, you know, the same nib, say like a custom 743, they're going to have a fine and then a soft fine. So whatever magic that they do to make that same nib softer, I imagine it probably has more to do with like the thickness and taper and some of that kind of stuff, but they're doing something to essentially 
somewhat weaken uh, the gold and its flexibility to make it feel softer. But there's an art form to it. You don't just want to just shave off a bunch of metal because then if, if you don't do it right, you can have a soft nib, but then you're going to bend it and it's going to, you need the right spring back. So it's got to be like more of a tapering that's thicker and it gets thinner as it gets towards the tip. There's a whole art form to that. It's, this is mostly stuff you can't even really see with your naked eye. It's like tons of handwork and it's all complicated. Um, but that definitely is, is another factor. You can have nibs that are designed kind of to be softer intentionally. Um, all right. So that's like the physical kind of nature of the nib. So that was like part one of my whatever factors that go into feedback. Um, the second one is the tipping. So this one might even be more important, honestly. So this is the part that actually, this is where the rubber meets the road, as they say, because the tip is what actually touches the paper. So I think that that's gonna play probably the biggest role in how that nib is gonna feel. Though, like most other things, it's gonna go in kind of interplay with the softness of the nib and all that kind of stuff. So as to say like, which one or the other has a bigger impact, they both do. Anyway, the tipping. So. Tipping is really not going to impact how bouncy a nib feels because that is all, you know, this is like your tires and then the, the rest of the nib is kind of like the suspension, I guess, if you're going the car analogy. Um, but the, the tipping itself is going to make a huge difference in terms of the feedback from the paper by how much it grabs or slides across the paper as you write. So this is all about friction, right? So it's less about bendy bendy and it's more about friction. So the smaller the tip size, you mentioned this in your question, Eric, um, the smaller the tip size, the more feedback you're gonna feel because all of your writing pressure is gonna be concentrated in a smaller area, right? So the more pressure you have in a smaller area, the more friction and pressure there's gonna be, therefore you're gonna get more feedback, right? So if you have your extra fines, ultra extra fines, stuff like that, it's gonna feel a little toothier unless you lighten up on your pressure, right? So if you write with a fine nib, you gotta lighten up on your pressure, otherwise it's gonna feel much more draggy, right? Especially on the cross strokes. Um, that's been my experience. Um, so if you are one like me who has a slightly heavier hand, I don't love the finer nibs so much, partly because I don't love how they feel. But Drew has a lighter hand because he just doesn't live as intensely as I do apparently. And possesses some manner of self-control. It's funny because as I was kind of researching some of this, it got into like, what is it called? Like graph graphology or something like that. Like the interpretation of handwriting. And let me tell you, it gets very woo woo very quickly. And some of this is like, if you have a lot of writing pressure, it means you feel your emotions very deeply and you don't let things go. You forgive, but you don't forget. Oh my and all God. This. And I was like, okay. That's not you at all. Like you're reading into this a bit too much. <laughs> But I did think it was funny, like living very intensely. And I was like, I do do that. I mean, yeah, that's but the, that's it the feels one. Kind of, it feels kind of like a horoscope where it's like you can interpret parts of whatever that is to yeah, whoever it might that's be. that's silly. So anyway, but that's neither here nor there. That's a distraction. Um, okay, so smaller tip size, the more you're going to feel that friction, right? Um, the specific shape or the grind of the nib is going to have an impact, right? So obviously the smaller the tip, like it's been shaped around, it's finer, of course. Um, but basically how much tipping is making contact with the paper is going to play, play a part. Um, but it's also going to matter the smoothness of the polish on that tipping, right? So you can have the same, let's go with a medium nib or a broad nib even. So there's plenty making contact with there. But if you have a finer polish, basically a smoother tip, you're going to feel less drag, less friction on the page. That seems to make sense, right? So if you're like, I don't know, roller skating on gravel, it's going to feel very different than if you're roller skating on a roller skating rink, right? I don't know why I went with that analogy, but there you go. So obviously the smoothness and stuff like that will matter. That's a bad analogy because that would be more like the paper, changing the paper. The analogy but, I, I used in one of our previous videos was uh, to take a ping pong ball and compare it to a golf ball. They're yeah, both, they're both there you go. rolling across the surface and one is completely smooth. One is a little bit textured. They're both, yeah, they're both gonna, balls. They're both going to roll just fine, Yeah, but you're going to feel one. Yeah. That's a good, that's a better analogy than my roller skating rink, whatever. I spent um, hours trying to draft that script. So, you okay. know, I literally just came up with it on the fly. I didn't even make that in my notes. That's but, okay. Okay. So the shape of the grind. Okay. Um, and different manufacturers have different grits of polish that they'll take their nibs up to. Uh, and not only that, but they may vary that based on the specific pen model, based on the nib size. And they really don't disclaim or say anything because it's all trade secret kind of stuff. 
we are just basically left to figure it out. Um, so that's all kind of fun, um, but there's no one standard for any of it. Um, and it's also part science and part art, just because, and Drew and I know this because we've done some nib tuning training, if we both take the exact same grit of say micro mesh, and we are both taking the same pen, same nib to it, our technique of how we smooth that will give us a, a feelable different result um, based on how we are smoothing it. If I smooth it and I've got a much heavier hand, that's gonna probably have a rougher outcome than if you have a lighter hand, like Drew, who lives less intensely uh, than me <laughs> and holds grudges less apparently. <laughs> um, so that also, that's like where part science and part art comes in like nibs they're just you know if you are truly just mechanizing nibs yes you can produce nibs that are fairly consistent and all that kind of stuff but i've really only ever seen that with steel nibs pretty much every manufacturer that i know that has gold nibs you can you can mechanize parts of it but it all comes down to handwork for all the final especially the final parts the shaping and the tuning of the nib because it just requires that human touch um, uh, and lastly, the, the specific alloy of the tipping material, we talked about the alloy of gold, but the alloy of the tipping material can probably make some difference in the feel. I don't know that's not necessarily at play and there's so many other factors. I don't, and, and also we have no idea what tipping alloy any manufacturer uses because it's all trade secret kind of stuff. I don't think there's a whole ton of them out there. Like there's like one, you know, alloy tipping company that most manufacturers use, I know. So I don't know how many different composites they have and all that, but it's basically all precious metals. There's rhodium, there's other things in there. Um, it's gonna be all pretty hard wearing stuff. So that may be a factor, but I don't think it's a big one. Um, so the challenging thing about all this and all these factors that go into stiffness and smoothness um, is that they aren't totally quantified with each pen. So we get some factors that are like approaching quantifiability, such as, you know, maybe the nib metal, like the gold steel, whatever, the carat rating of gold, you know, the nib grind, the size of the grind, stuff like that. Um, but even those are gonna have a range to them and they're mixed in with all of the other harder to measure factors too. So it's really tough to basically compare one pen to another because there's so many factors and they all overlap. Um, there are other factors too, I think, beyond just the nib, such as the pen itself, the pen material, the size, the weight, things like that. Essentially, since feedback is vibration through the pen, if you have a heftier, heavier pen, or maybe you just the way you grip it, you're gripping it in a different place, like that also might impact how much you're feeling the feedback of the thing. So you can have literally the same nib, but if you have it on different pens, you might feel that feedback differently because of the pen itself. So that's a whole other thing to kind of throw into the mix. Um, and, you know, and also if you have different pens, you, because of the way you have to hold the pen, you may hold it at a different angle. You may write differently with one pen versus the other. That could change how the nib actually feels on the page. So, you know, it's not unlike comparing like maybe wines to each other where there's so many different factors, you know some of it, but most of it you don't. Um, or maybe golf clubs, I assume. I'm not a golfer, but I feel like golf clubs are one of those things where it's like there's all these different technical things and there's like some marketing hype in there, some of it, and it's like, okay, yeah, there might be some of those kind of elements that matter, especially for like professionals where they're super consistent and all that. But like, is the average person gonna notice the difference between one driver and another? Like maybe, maybe not. I don't know. <coughs> I feel like you get some of that when you get into some of this pen kind of stuff. So there's definitely nitty gritty <coughs> factors that will make a difference ultimately, but really it all boils down to how does it feel to you and that's what's gonna matter the most. So it is pretty frustrating when you're shopping for pens and nibs to know exactly like before you get into it, what you should look for and what you're gonna get into. And it's just one of those things that sadly it's kind of like, it's kind of like clothing where like you don't know it's kind of what's going to fit your body until you kind of just put it on your body. Yeah. You know, but so. there are reviews yep. and videos. We, we do the best we can to talk through it. You do the best you can to try to look through it. But that's why we're pretty forgiving when it comes to our return policy and exchanging stuff like that. You know, ideally we want you to have the right thing that you get. You know, when you, especially when you commit, you get your hopes up, you, you know, you want to do it. But uh, it is it is pretty tough when you go from like especially one one pen model to another, but especially like one manufacturer to another. They can vary quite a bit and it's kind of confusing sometimes. So I feel your pain on that. But 
That's why we have multi-hour podcasts every week to explain all these intricacies because it never ends and it just gets more complex the more you get into it. But anyway, that's my deep dive. How'd I do, Drew? Did I keep you engaged well enough? Oh, no, but I, I hope I hope. <laughs> Hopefully you faked, faked it, it. well. You I don't. Faked it well. I, I, every time I think I do, I get called out in the comments like, "Wow, Drew looked like he was about to fall asleep." Well, so I'm like, I, let us know. Let us know I how did Drew do? I mean, apart from like, <laughs> I don't know what it can do. Uh, to me, the core of this was Eric saying, "Why would a sailor give more feedback than a pilot?" Oh, okay. And if I were to answer this question, I would simply say, if you're Maybe ever po- if yeah. you're if you're ever polishing anything, you use multi step process. You've got five levels of abrasives. You start with five, you work your way down to one, five being very coarse, one being very smooth. Mm -hmm. A company like Sailor, Aurora, they go five, four, three, and then stop at three. Mm -hmm. And then companies like Pilot, they go all the way to one. Yeah. So they're probably just polishing it to a finer grit. Yeah. Well, I will say the Sailor's nibs are, especially the 14K nibs, those nibs are stiffer than the Pilot nibs. I'm not talking about stiffness. I'm talking about feedback. I think stiffness plays a part in that feedback. Is what I'm saying. I don't know how much. Maybe it's like a 70 30 kind of a thing. Maybe I think feed, feedback is all about the roughness of the of the tipping material. I I don't know, but that that would be my version of the answer. I think that is a great point. You enjoy, yeah, yeah. Either way, they've 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 gone through the whole thing at this point. Yeah. So there's, yeah, <laughs> TLDR. There are a lot of factors involved and we're kind of just stabbing in the dark a little bit with the very few reference points that we have. Um, ultimately, you just read a bunch of reviews and see what people say as to which nibs feel smoother more or less than others and make your best guess. That's it. All right. <clears throat> okay, my brain is warm. I've done a lot of talking. So now, Drew, now it's your turn. All right, this is from John Paul. Dear Brian and Drew, we all know that certain pens, for example, platinum pens, can survive extended periods of disuse without drying out, but other pens struggle to stay dry even for a week. I've noticed that some pens are sneakily good at staying wet and ready to write. Let me explain. I have a copper Kueco Lilliput that simply refuses to dry out. I recently moved and left this pen inked and packed away for four months. When I finally resurrected it from its cardboard grave, which I love that description, I could discern no noticeable difference in its readiness to write. I have noticed this before as well. I regularly leave this pen inked and unused for weeks at a time. It has never once dried out on me. This pen has no inner cap, no O-ring, nor any other mechanism to keep the cap well sealed. It appears to simply defy the laws of the universe. What are your top picks for some sneakily good pens that simply won't dry out despite not having any fancy mechanisms to keep them wet? John, I completely agree with you. I have the aluminum Lilliput, the Mm -hmm. uh, more affordable green one. It is a champ. It does not dry out. It like, I didn't expect it at all. Mm -hmm. And it, it stays ready always. It's been fantastic. And I just, I've never really talked to anybody about it. It's just been a pen in my collection that I can always count on. Yeah. And I've got my three pens inked up and of the three, if I, you know, leave my pens here over a long weekend, forget to bring them home, I'll come back here. Two of them might be like, okay, but that Mm -hmm. Lilliput always ready to go. Yeah. So yes, the Lilliput, definitely a sleeper in terms of staying wet and ready to write. So great sealing cap on that. It's got very, very fine threads on that, which lead me to my next point. I went around to customer care and I asked them, Mm-hmm. This question, like, do you all have any sort of deceptively awesome cappers? And they all said Kaveco. So, hmm. and if you'll remember, those sports have very, very tight fine, threads. Fine threads, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they said that the sports are usually really great. Okay. And then, um, let's see. Uh, yeah. So I think, I don't know if anybody mentioned the Perkeo, but yeah. So apparently, Kaveco just is deceptively good. That was the consensus, the Mm -hmm. most surprising bit. So I've got some thoughts on that that I'll share in a minute. Yeah. So for whatever reason, those, those seem to do really well. Mm -hmm. And then, um, real quick, before you move on, I have a lily put, it was a fire blue Mm -hmm. that I had left in my pocket. It was inked. Uh, it went through the washing machine 
which obviously has ample opportunity. It's like immersed and tumbling around in water it for like an got hour. got unfired a little bit. And then it went through the dryer as well. So rather extreme situations. What are the dryers? What, like 150 degrees or something like that? I don't know if it's that hot, but whatever. It's pretty hot. Yeah. And I pulled it out and the, the fire blue, unfortunately, had lost a little bit of its luster through that process. But uh, the pen just wrote as if I just pulled it out of my pocket. Was there any water yeah. in the cap at all? No. Yeah. It didn't even like burp or leak into the cap. And there's nothing in the cap. Like it's just, it just seals really well. Well, I think that's part of, specifically part of Coeco's advantage in that case is because they don't have a clip. The clip is usually, uh, basically you have two places where air can act, like get in there and kind of screw things up. You got the hole where the clip goes in through the cap. So that's why a lot of pens have an inner cap seal to it is because there's a giant gaping hole wherever that clip goes through and you really can't perfectly seal that off because it's a hole. So that's why you have inner caps for a lot of these. Um, Coeco doesn't have that because they don't have clips. Any clip that you get has to like attach to the outside of the pen. So that's a huge advantage. Um, plus the fact that they're, well, I guess the plastic versions are plastic, but the metal, metal is rather impermeable and there's nothing that's going to leach through that material. The sports do have an air cap though. So the do, okay. there is that. Okay. But still go. like Kaveco is not what pops into my head when I think of really like it's not like a, that seal really it's not well. like a selling point that no they you think you think of twisby you think of platinum you yeah. think of pilot sailor like yeah. those obviously those are the, the big dogs yeah. of the industry and we all know that those seal really <coughs> really well yeah and for sure you should pursue those brands if that's mm -hmm. super important to you platinum's fantastic yeah twisby's great at that even with their um snap cap pens mm -hmm. they're great at that and but yeah kaveco is a bit of a dark horse there i think maybe the fact that the pen itself is like a smaller, like more of a pocket pen. That's more of like the deciding factor for why people get them. It's not necessarily like rated on par with all of the other pens that like might not dry out as much. Because like, if you're gonna get a Kaweco, you're probably gonna get it because you like the form factor. You know what I mean? So like any other thing related to it might get overshadowed a little bit. Yeah, but that one did surprise me, but I'm, I wasn't surprised at all to hear about the Lilliput because mine is fantastic. Yeah. Another Supra, The Supra too, I would imagine, right? It's like a big Lilliput. I haven't, I don't have a lot of experience with the Supra, um, like writing, I've tested it obviously, but yeah. I haven't actually, I've never owned one. So I haven't written with it over, you know, yeah. the weekend or anything I've, like that. I've got them, but I haven't like had them inked up for I really want to buy, I want to buy that black one, the black aluminum. Like that's, that's, cool that's got my one. name on I just haven't pulled the trigger yet. I've got the like stainless one that thing freaking weighs it's like I, an yeah, anchor I, in my I don't pocket. want one of the heavy ones the, <laughs> the black aluminum though that that's I'm definitely gonna get one of those yeah and I've got a list I've got a shopping list I've got my Goulet cart filled right now <laughs> I think my next purchases are gonna be an Esterbrook 40 pen case the canvas mm. ones and yeah, then, you've had your eye on that for a while I know I just need to buy it yeah um <laughs> so the other dark horse that I'll mention is the Opus 88 all of the Opus 88 pens mm. seal very well Opus 88 is a brand for us that our customer care team really loves because the amount of returns or complaints from that brand is kind of non-existent. Yeah. Granted, it's not; it doesn't sell like a brand like Pilot or Visconti's, you know. So yeah. take that ratio for what it is. But still, we sell enough. We we would discontinue the brand if we didn't sell. So we do sell them, but yet no one complains about them. And we have a couple of the customer care team that are really into Opus 88, Adrian and Jessica specifically. They yeah. love Opus. Yeah. And it's just a good brand and it they don't dry out. Yeah. And for a pen with that much ink, um, now I do believe mm. there, there there's not necessarily an inner cap, but the cap itself is molded in such a way. Yeah, because that the clip... The clip on that one, you've got like an unscrewable finial basically. Mm -hmm. So the clip actually isn't going through the cap. So it's essentially kind of the same effect as yeah. the Cueco where it's like completely sealed inside there. And then you have very fine threads. Right. And those are long threads too. It's like three and a half rotations yeah. to uncap that thing, which sucks for quick draw, you know, stuff, but does a great job at sealing it. Yeah. Opus 88 is not a quick draw pen. It is a novella pen. The long draw. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you're uncapping that bad boy. Well, it's an eyedropper fill too. You're, yeah, you're, you're putting you're putting some thoughts down. You're writing yeah. your manifesto with that thing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Opus eighty eight, and uh, I agree on uh, John's point with the Caveco. Definitely pen brands mm -hmm. not to overlook if you're looking for brands that uh, are gonna keep 
things ready to write. Yeah. Um, I have a couple other pens to add to the mix as well. I've been daily carrying my little traveler's pen. Um, oh, hang on. Did I lock? I dropped it down in my pocket. Yep, it's in here. Why is your pocket making so much noise? What do you... I just have a couple things in there. Do you have <clears throat> rocks in there? No, it's my All keys. Right. Okay. Keys in my ear earbuds. Um, so here's my little traveler's pen. So this is not a threaded cap, nope. but this thing never fails me. It stays. I mean, I've put it through just about every situation you can imagine. And it writes incredibly reliably. Did you not buy one of those factory green ones? I did. You did? Okay, good. I don't carry it around in my pocket because I want to keep that one looking yeah. like nice. But this as is as much like as my... you like this one, I wish I almost wish you would have bought a second one so you could beat it up a little bit. But then again, this one ain't broke. I mean, I per I don't polish this one. Oh. It just is what it is. It's so scratched it looks up. Looks very loved. Like it stays next to my pocket knife. in your earbuds. It stays next to my pocket knife, which I used to keep the pocket knife on the outside of my pocket and this next to it. And it would like rub up against the blade. And so I'm like, okay, I'll switch the order of that. So now I keep the pen on the outside. So now it's just like this. I guess there's a little metal down here that could maybe do it, but it's mostly plastic rubbing against. So that's, that helps maybe, I guess, but it doesn't matter. It's, yeah, that's no a little one, champ. No one cares. That no is cares. a little champ. I love that pen. That's a great pen. It's It stays sealed really well. Um, so it's a very reliable one, which is why I keep it in my pocket. And then, um, yeah, I mentioned the Quaker Supra. That I would imagine would be similar to the Lilliput, though. I mean, it's a bigger pen, bigger threads. I think it still seals really well, um, but I think that would also do well. If you want to write one off for me, you know, for research purposes. To test, yeah. Yeah, I mean, oh, okay. I would be willing to do that for the company. It's generous of you to yeah, offer. Yeah, welcome. I'll give that yeah. consideration. Team player. I'll talk to my boss. Um, Twisby Eco, I will say I have a personal story with Twisby Eco of just how well that thing seals. So um, when the Eco first came out, this was like eight years ago or something. I got my first Eco and I inked it up with Urban Emerald de Chavour, which is a sheening, shimmering ink. Um, and then I sort of forgot about it for eight months. So I left that ink in there for eight months and uncapped it. And it wrote like I had had it capped for five minutes. So With a shimmer ink. With a shimmer ink. And God. There. And it was just literally just sitting there. I didn't move for like eight months. I think it was in my drawer or something like that. And I have a lot of pens and, you know, it's easy for loose track here and there. Was it, was it, it wasn't nibbed down? No, I think it was just leaning sideways, okay, you know, just good. laying down. Because yeah. if it was nibbed down, all the shimmer would have gone down into the feed. But if it was laying on yeah, its maybe. side, it maybe. probably like, it probably helped it a lot. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that did help. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, nib up would be good too. But. Either way, like if it had evaporated like at all, then it would have had all, all kinds of problems. It certainly but, would because of the sheen too. Yeah, it just went, it just went just fine. TCB. Yep. Um, so that worked really well. Uh, Pilot Metropolitan is also a really good one at doing that as really? well. Really? You think yeah, so? Yeah, I, I think it does well. I've never had a problem with a Metropolitan. I have not had good luck with Metros. Really? Yeah. To, okay. me, they're, to me, they're about on par with Safaris. Like they're, yeah. they're fine, but not great. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I wouldn't maybe necessarily say it's like, standout-ish, but I've, I've always had pretty good luck with them. Um, Platinum Preppy, that one, I think. Well, of course. That one has more of a mechanism in there. I mean, that one's it. known for being, like, that's not a dark, that's not a underrated one. Like, I mean, most people buy because it's cheap, but like... They, they say that it can, you can keep days, it on... Yeah. You, they say you can keep it inked up, like Platinum advertises that you can keep it inked up for like a year. Well, I know they do with the slip and seal. I don't think the Preppy technically has the slip and seal on it. They have other pens, like, oh, okay. I, I think it's the... Profonde yeah, we we, yeah we, we we went over this. We went this yeah, before. I think they. I forgot it. You can call them all slip and seal if you want um, to. And then last but not least, I had to say the Pilot Varsity because we've gotten some stories recently of yeah people having them for like decades. That one definitely and still going. That is that not one, that, that is one not is, one that I would think. That one definitely is a dark horse. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Which that is going to be our spotlight today. Yep. So we'll be talking about varsities. There's nothing on the varsity. I mean, I guess it has it has an inner seal, so that's something. But it's a cheap pen. You would not think no. that it would do that well. Anyway. All right. That's all I got to say. All right. We got one more question. Oh, for, well, for yeah. My turn. Yep. Um, Chris and Trisha. Trisha. Chris and Trisha. Trisha. <laughs> um, hi, Brian and Drew. Love the pen cast. Learning a lot from you folks. I have attempted to introduce my wife. I guess this is Chris talking about Trisha. Mm. Two fountain pens with gifts of a Lamy Safari and a Twisby 580 ALR. Okay. However, my wife is a heavy hand writer 
Pages are curled when she uses ballpoint pens. Oh Woo. My. Woo. Consequently, she writes with some trepidation when using fountain pens and cannot get used to using them. Hmm. Can you recommend pens with robust nibs for a heavy-handed writer or tips to retrain the writing method? Thanks so much for any advice you can provide. I will now turn this question over to a heavy-handed writer who, after you know almost 15 years, has not changed his writing pressure at all. Uh... <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't have a way to quantify that. <laughs> oh, you but got it quantified to you at DC. I got it quantified this year, but I don't know what it was 15 years ago. You know what I mean? I don't Do you know. think you've gotten heavier? I don't know. Heavier in your no, hand? No, probably not. I probably got, I probably lightened up a little bit. But I, I have some things to say. Okay. About this. I have some things to say. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, first off, uh, really like the Safari and the 580 or 210 pens that I probably would recommend. The Safari nib is very robust. Like, yeah, those are both very durable nibs. Yeah. And they're both like quasi replaceable too. So they're actually, you've already kind of got the tools that yeah, I would recommend. Like the, that Lamy steel nib, like can you get a more robust nib than that? It's it's pretty hardy. Yeah. I can't think of one. No. Nah. Yeah. I mean, you, you would probably break the fins on that feed before you, that hold the nib on there before you, yeah, would, those before little, you would damage the those nib. little rails. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you, I, that so rarely happens. Yeah. That's a little tank of a nib. So I think you've got, I think you've got the right tools already. Um, so my number one tip, and this relates to some research that I actually came across. Mm. Um, number one tip is slow down, slow your roll. Um, so I found a National Institute of Health article called the quantitative evaluation of handwriting factors that affect pen operating skills. Yes, this is a very academic scientific kind of article um, that was honestly talking about more for like occupational therapy purposes, but they did all kinds of experimentation and used pressure plates and all this kind of stuff. It was very boring, but the TLDR was that they found that writing faster increases your writing pressure. Um, whereas slowing down and writing more intentionally typically uses less pressure. So just by the act of writing slower, will cause that pressure to ease up a little bit. Um, and it made me think about an expression I've heard a bunch, especially in like the special forces community, that slow is smooth and smooth is fast. So by writing more intentionally, slowing it down a little bit and focusing on consistency and pacing, like having a steady cadence, um, you might actually get better results all around. So that would just be, in a very broad stroke, my number one tip would just be to slow down that writing. And uh, naturally, Trisha, you might find that uh, your writing will not be as like bearing down if you just write a little slower. Um, so, but also I'll say, I understand that trepidation. It's very easy to think of fountain pens as these like dainty tools that you have to handle with kid gloves. Um, but you basically just have to sort of start using, using them and get, get used to them. I don't know how much you've actually been using them. Sounds like you've been trying, um, but you know, don't lose heart. I, I don't want you to feel like you're going to maybe damage these pens by writing too hard. I guess that's possible, but you would have to really, really with a lami nib, really mash it, yeah, some kind of hard. Um, so I would say it's maybe going to take a little bit of retraining, a little bit of practice, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, especially if you're kind of doing it intentionally. Um, you know, I don't necessarily have like a specific method maybe to try that. We do have the art of cursive penmanship. Um, the Michael Saul book that if you're trying to like learn like American cursive, you know, that's a good book for intentionally trying to do that. But if you're like trying to see if fountain pens are kind of worth the hassle, I wouldn't necessarily say that that book is like what you should dive into. That's more if you're like really want to improve your actual handwriting and then there's going to be good tips in there too. Um, but that is a resource potentially. So I don't know, Chris, maybe you buy that book and then read it and then share some of the tips you learned from that with Trisha, maybe. Um, so uh, I will say one of my favorite things about fountain pens is that they don't need the same writing pressure. Um, so once you can kind of like get used to that and relax a little bit more as you write, write with less pressure, that's gonna strain your muscles less. It's gonna allow you to write with more comfort for longer. That's a major selling point. Um, and then the last thing, this is going back to when a very distinct memory I had when I first started using fountain pens. I wanted basically very dark ink, very bold lines. 
So I was mashing my nibs down because I wasn't using a broad enough nib to my liking, and I wasn't using a saturated, a dark enough ink. Oh, so that's a little like a little and philosophical. I, like, why does she want to mash down? Well, what clearly, is she searching for? She's clearly holding grudges <laughs> and not <laughs> forgiving and not forgetting. Um, no, uh, I think it's a natural thing that that I did not think about that until. I started, you know, because of the business that we're in. You were searching for a result that you weren't getting, so you yeah, just found basically. another way to get your result. Yeah, I was using some like fairly saturated blues with, you know, some like medium nibs and stuff like that. And I found like I was mashing them down because I wanted to get a darker ink. I wanted to get darker result. And then once I used broader nibs and stubs and used much more saturated colors, I was like, oh, I can like ease up a little bit because I'm actually getting the results I want. So I wonder, I have no context to know that if this is your case, Trisha, but uh, that was definitely the case for me when I started out. So trying out some different inks, different nibs, maybe you will find that you can, you know, uh, ease up on the writing pressure um, and have more comfort just by using the right kind of combination of stuff. Um, so I would just encourage you to continue experimenting, trying <clears throat> different things. And that's also like a free pass, Chris, to just get more stuff and, you know, try and, find out what Trisha's into. All in her interest, of course. You know, you need more nibs and pens and ink, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> that would be my justification. But My approach, okay. we're going to go Rocky style with this one. Oh. I believe in Rocky 2, Mickey tied Rocky's left arm to his chest so he learned how to punch right-handed because okay. Rocky's a southpaw, you know. Mm -hmm. We're going to do something similar with Trisha here. Because she just cannot slow her roll, Chris, your job as her trainer in this Rocky-esque oh scenario. I thought this was a serious answer, but I see, it where, is. I see where you're going with it this. It is. No, this is a serious answer. Tie Trisha's arm Hold on. Her. No, no, no. She's not getting tied up. Her pen's getting tied up. <laughs> what we're going to do, Chris, you take Trisha's safari or whatever she wants to use. You get a couple rubber bands or some twine. You find a pretty hefty soup ladle from the kitchen. And you tie that soup ladle to the end of the pen, back weighting it to an extraordinary degree <laughs> so that really physics mm. is what's helping Trisha not press down hard. She's Gravity is pulling her nib away from her page. So That's a lot of back weight, a soup ladle? Right. Well, yeah, wow. yeah, like... Trish is going to need to manage her strength, and uh, mm. she's not going to want to overexert herself because she's going to exhaust herself pretty quickly if she does. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're going to want to position that soup ladle pointing down, not 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 up, you know, because... Oh. you want to really get that leverage yeah. going on there. Yeah, 100%. Wow. We're not okay. messing around. Okay. So what we do, we start with a soup ladle, and then we graduate uh, down the... the Maybe to like a gravy ladle after that. Well, I was thinking you know? slotted spoon. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. you know, well, no, solid spoon, then slotted spoon okay. because of the weight. Lighten up the weight a yes, little bit. Yeah. Yes, Okay. So. Um, like a wooden slotted spoon. There you go. You're more. catching on. You got graduation. You got here. it. You got this it. This is great advice, Drew. I've never. Thank you. I've never heard Thank anybody you. recommend this as a as a practice. That's why but, you hired uh, me, I'm sure. Oh, um, so the box thinking. Chris, you can approach the Drew method. Uh, <laughs> it'll work, guaranteed. Mm. It is. Um, Tried and true, Are zero you times. It? You're guaranteeing us. I'm guarantee. I'm guaranteeing results. Mm. Oh, that's a glittering generality if I've ever heard one. <laughs> My kids learned about that. Results they it guaranteed. Me. There you go. Wow, that's that's not good. defining those results, but yes, <laughs> there yeah. will be results. There will be results. It's like guaranteed. That, it's like uh, my my father-in-law hates the expression when you say like, "Oh, that's tasty." He's like, "Taste is a." <laughs> It's a yes. neutral term. It could be horrible. It could be terrible taste. It could be great yes. taste. So just saying something is tasty means nothing. Right. Yeah. You could smell the funny. best thing in the world and be like, oh, that smells. Like, yeah. wait. It smells good or what? smells bad. What does that mean? Mm, that smells. Like, wait, yeah. ew, wait. What's your problem? Yeah. This is lasagna. He also doesn't like the expression, that's what I'm saying. It's like, yes, that's redundant. <laughs> Obviously, you're saying it because you said it. You don't need to say that you said it. I think that's funny. I, I, I love him. That's fantastic. Yeah, he's very, he's like Rachel. He's very pregnant. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Okay, cool. Well, uh, some really good advice and some outside the box thinking. Oh, don't be rude to Drew. yourself. Bro. Oh, wait. Oh, whoa. Yeah. From Drew. From Drew. I feel outside like. Outside the box. Okay, yeah. I didn't outside say the outside the box is. All right. Got a lot of 
qualities to it. I'm outside the box in another box labeled awesome advice. There you go. That's Drew's opinion. So uh, you can email us questions at pencast at gulepens.com, especially if you're an audio listener. Um, leave us comments uh, elsewhere that we've already talked about in this pencast. Um, I think we're ready for a pen spotlight, Drew. Are you ready to spotlight the Varsity? Can, can, the pen that we've talked about so much? Yes. Let's actually do it. Let's do it. And I'm going to dismantle some pens. It's going to be great. Let's rock. Okay. All right. Let's roll. Brian, you have got a smorgasbord. I do. I am missing a couple. I'm missing the black one, and there's another color. But there's a seven-pack of Varsities. What's crazy, though, is like we have, I think, the black, the blue, and something else maybe individually. But if you want to get all the colors, you have to get the seven pack, basically. Yeah. So that's kind of a bummer. That's just how Pilot offers it. But um, anyway, Pilot Varsity. I have the old school Varsity too, which I think is fun. Kind of reminds me of like an old like pinstripe baseball uniform. Oh, I like that one better. Well, you can't get it. So Darn it. it reminds me of bad. that's the, that's as close <laughs> to the uh, you know Mew as I'm gonna get. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah, there you go. So old versus new. Now, I believe these, these are, are also ones. called the V-Pen in other countries. I think you're right because they have to name everything different everywhere. Um, so the reason I brought this old school one was not just to show you the different design, but uh, it's also because this one's empty. So it's easier for me to demonstrate some stuff, though my hands are already inky, so I'll just demonstrate with the full version anyway. Nice. Um, but wanted to show kind of up close what you're dealing with with the Varsity. Um, so it's an eyedropper, basically filled pen. They come pre-filled. The color matches whatever the cap is. And it has, you know, your window here. Um, I measured it. It is one and a half milliliter in capacity. Well, how about that? Yep. Isn't that about the size of a standard international converter? No, that, that's a half a milliliter. Oh, half. Oh, sorry. So one, this is a one and a half milliliter. Oh, yikes. That was so way this off. is about three times what you get with a converter. Funny enough, though, when I actually pulled this thing apart, the actual ink capacity only goes to about here. It's like just barely past the ink window. It's not hmm. filling the whole pen. There's like a, it stops it right there, which kind of makes sense because if you think like back here, like this part is not attached. No. This is like a separate piece. So you wouldn't actually, you know, be able to eyedrop or convert it unless there was, it's basically like a container inside. Yeah, the pen. that makes sense. So whatever, that doesn't really matter. Um, so it comes pre-inked, you use it. It's medium nib only, but they write really, really well. Um, it has like a sort of a fake breather hole there. It's like impressed into the nib. It's mm -hmm. got a little hole, but it's not actually a hole, which is fine. doesn't really matter. Um, but the nib, you can slide it off. Like you can just kind of see if I can do it. There you go. Oop. So the nib slides off, which I guess is makes for easier cleaning. And there's the wick. You generally won't need. So there's the wick. How about that? I've never seen so, that before. Yeah. So now you can see sort of how it works. So basically, I don't know how easily you can get in there. But um, so the wick basically kind of comes up to the top of the, you know, where the it mates up with the nib, but then it kind of slumps down and then goes through the middle. Mm -hmm. So you're still getting the fins and all that kind of stuff, which is all inside the grip. Um, a lot of feeds will have this kind of fin system inside the grip of the pen, but usually unless your grip is translucent, you're not going to see all those fins. So, you know, we've gotten questions before about like, nibs that have a lot of fins on the outside. And then we talked about like, well, basically pretty much all nib, all feeds will have fins somewhere. This one's just got them all on the inside here. So you got whole body filled with ink, fins here, a wick that draws from that, mates it up to the back of the nib and it writes. And it writes incredibly reliably, apparently. So there you go. Fantastic. Um, so that's the basic design of the pen. I mean, I can write with a couple different ones so you get a sense of, you know, how thick the line is, I guess. Granted, I'm just writing this on blank paper, so maybe that's not giving you, but you know, it's just by the weight of the pen, which is not very much. I have to put a little bit of pressure on it because the pen's so light that it won't do it. But I mean, it's it writes pretty reliably. Yeah, it's about a fine, right? I can mash it down a little bit and get um, I think it's a medium nib technically, but it's, you know, like a pilot medium. So it's slightly finer than most, but you know, um, yeah, it's, it's very reliable. The nib is very, very round, very ball like. So you don't really get any like specific shape to it. Um, you know, cross stroke, down stroke, pretty even, um, feels very smooth. Um, surprisingly it, smooth. Yeah. Especially for the price of the nib, you would expect it to write worse, but it's 
pretty good. The pen, the, the pen new, itself is very light. Yeah, very light. So I find that, you know, granted I have a heavier hand too, so I don't know how good of a gauge I am, but I will I will press a little bit more on this pen just because it is so light. It is. Yeah. I, I press down into it a little bit more. No, I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you. It is it, very, very light. It's about as light as it gets. I don't remember exactly what the stat is, but it's like, I think it's like sub 10 grams if I'm not mistaken. It's pretty dang light. Um, yeah, so... The cool thing about this, I mean, it's a it's a great, it's a reliable pen. I love these pens for giving them to people that don't have a lot of experience with fountain pens because it's you're going to get a good experience and it's pretty hard to screw it up. But I wanted to show you all a hack. So if you want to use a different ink inside these pens, you can. It's a little it's a little dangerous. So um, what I found is that it takes some some fortitude and determination. And I'm gonna do this on an inked up pen because I think it's more entertaining. So I'm gonna take this pen and I'm going to remove the nib in the feed, okay? And then show you how to eyedropper fill this thing if you are so inclined. Yeah, let's do it. So um, first thing that I find is helpful is to take the nib off. Basically it slides off just like pretty much any other nib that you would have. It's more like a Lamy nib where it's got these like kind of wings mm -hmm. that it slides onto. Um, but there you go. Now you know why my fingers are already red. Couple tools that are helpful. Some sort of rubber barrier. You can use an old bicycle tire. You can use a Goulet grip, which is what I have here that I've already mangled pretty well. And then I find a pair of pliers. Now I would oh, not. Oh yikes! I would not normally recommend. Oh no! That you take pliers to any pen for any reason, but this is a disposable pen. The risk is pretty low. If you've already used up the pen, and you want to just fill it with more ink you really have nothing to lose because the pen is basically trash otherwise. So this is a hack, you know, of course, Pilot would not <laughs> claim warranty on any of this stuff, but whatever, this is what I'm doing. So um, what you don't wanna do is grab the sides of it because you don't wanna mash those wings. You wanna grab it from the top and the bottom. So what I do is I take my little grip and I sort of wrap it around, um, around in that area, maybe not use the part that's already all chewed up. So. Keep it like that. So I'm gonna be grabbing the top and the bottom and then I'm gonna grab my pliers and I'm going to, this just looks so dangerous, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um, especially cause it's already inked. Uh, and basically I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a pretty good clinching um, and then kind of wiggle it back and forth maybe a little bit. Oh my God. Just to oh my God. try and work Ow! it out. And it's like, it like snaps in place. So like I've got pretty strong fingers I cannot get these things out with my fingers. I would not resort to pliers unless I had to. Oh, wow. But then once you do, like, and then you've got to kind of pull it again because it's got to get past that point. It like really truly snaps in place. Um, but then once you do, there's the whole thing. You clean this out, you know, soak it, whatever you need to do to clean it out. Um, right now the pen has ink in it, but if it didn't, you would just wash this out with, you know, whatever. You can just probably run it out of the sink, maybe swab it out with a cotton swab and then put whatever the heck ink you want in here. Now, I would not fill it up past maybe this point right here, mm -hmm. like where the cap hits it, because if you fill it up more than that, then you're going to be putting the feed into it. Right. And you're going to make a big mess. Yeah, you need to keep the feed zone clear. Yeah. So once you're ready to put the thing back in there, you've cleaned everything out. It doesn't really matter what orientation you put it in, but I think it's nice to line the, the nib up to, you know, where it says Pilot Varsity. Um, you basically kind of stick it back in there. You got to press it a bit to get it past that initial point. If you just put it in here, it will close more or less, but you really got to push it until it snaps into place. So you'll hear it probably. Oh, definitely. It's, you got to really kind of go after Golly. it. But once you do, I mean, if you do it right, I've done this several times now. Um, I did it fresh on this particular pen, uh, you know, earlier today. I've done it a couple of times since then. It has not gotten easier to do at oh all my goodness. since I've done it. And then you just slide the nib right back. Wow. In there, and then you're good to go. This is the first for me, Brian. I've always known it can be done. I've never seen it done. That's how you do it. So uh -huh. you again, you got to really want it. But the risk is very low because at the point that you would be doing that, the pen is basically trashed anyway. Yeah. But you know what I would always do if you're going to be trashing the pen, just pull the nib off and just keep it as a spare for other varsities you might have. Why not? Um, but now you know the secrets of the varsity eyedropper conversion thing. So that's it. That's the Varsity. Cool pen. Fun things. Not often you get to take some pliers to your pens and feel good about it. But anytime you can mix pens and hand tools, it's a good time to me. Exactly. <laughs>
So there you go, Varsity. We talked about it so much, I'm glad we were able to feature it. Um, but yeah, I've thought about for a while doing like an actual standalone video of like how to refill or, or like eyedropper, yeah. you know, the Varsity. I mean, it's fascinating at the least. Yeah, so maybe we'll take this, if y'all are interested, well, maybe we'll see how y'all react to it on the, the Pencast here. Um, but if you would want maybe like a shorter, more referenceable video, I can just do that and we'll cut it, edit it together a little bit better. It'd probably be like a one minute, two minute video. Um, yeah, I'd be open to doing that. So anyway, that's what we got, Spotlight. Now, I think we're done with the pen talk and now we get to talk about nonsense with our what's happening. All right, Patches, what's going on? Patches, yeah, you saw my first note here. <laughs> I did. Uh, There's like a page break, so it literally says, Drew, Patches. Patches. I, for Christmas, was gifted, were gifted. I were, I was you gifted. Were. I, you were. Well, uh, I mean, you I, were, I was. Yeah. I was gifted. I can't say yes. I, you was, because that is not correct. I were, gi I were gifted uh, <laughs> four patches that I really wanted um, for really? my jean jacket. I, I saved four. a spot on my back for all four Ninja Turtles. <gasps> yeah, you Shannon, mentioned that. Shannon got me the Ninja Turtles. I started nice. this weekend with Leonardo, of course, because he's the best. Which Ninja Turtles are these? Are these the OG, like, 90s Turtles? These are not only the OG 90s Turtles, but they are taken their poses and likeness are taken from very specific moments oh so if you play the i think the super nintendo or arcade version of turtles in time okay um, classic the opening cinematic starts you see the little light coming out of the sewer grate mm -hmm. and then it shows every turtle in like a jumping towards you sort of freeze frame pose yes, of course and the patches depict those poses oh, that's awesome. so it's you know michelangelo Raphael. Oh, so is it like their whole body yeah or is it just their oh, whole body okay yeah i was thinking it was just their heads for some no reason. it's their whole body and then oh, then the nice. final one was leonardo but he comes at you very closely and like swords like the, slashes yeah. the screen yeah. yeah so he's slightly larger than their other three so it looks a little weird but i okay. love the fact that they're from one of my favorite ninja turtle video games of that's all time. pretty awesome so yeah. very excited about that they have been challenging because not only Mm. Do they have a very thick adhesive backing that yeah. you need to puncture with the needle? Yeah. But uh, it's not just like a circle or an oval or a square like a lot of my patches are. Like oh. Donatello has the very thin staff. Like oh, that's like a kiss cut kind of a yeah. thing. Yeah. Oh, so wow. it's been challenging. So um, yeah, uh, work worked my way through those. Okay, okay. Uh, I have to use needle nose pliers to insert and retract the needle sometimes because wow. it's so hard to penetrate wow so um what i should do is iron it on first and mm. then just sew it after the fact to just oh. keep it in place yeah but i'm but stubborn and i don't want to doing that i don't, oh, don't want I, I i like the fact that they're all easily removable i probably will never remove them but mm. i like the fact that i could just pull the stitches on any of them and reposition later if i wanted to you're never gonna do that. I don't think so, but I just how long? I, that's gonna be so much work. I know. And you've like planned all this out. And I know. Everything? I'm yeah. not gonna do it, but I still I haven't yeah. ironed any of them on yet, and I'm like, I'm so not. if we wanted to troll you, we would just go and iron on all your patches that are oh, already yeah. in place. I'd never know. But you would never know. Yeah, you can be like, yeah, ironed them unless you like, went to go move it, and you were just like, oh, yeah. So anyway, working on that. That's been fun. I've enjoyed that. Uh, let's see. Um, had a bit of a cool moment yesterday which was Monday, yes. um, I watched Mighty Ducks with Archer for the first time. Oh. And quack, 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 quack. Flying quack. bee! <laughs> so I had showed him cool runnings before because I thought that these like okay. Disney-based team sports movies would be cool and he would be engaged because I know I loved him when I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, he liked cool runnings okay, didn't really engage with it. So I was a little it's apprehensive. Contextual for the time. Yeah, yeah, but it's like, it's a better movie than Mighty Ducks. But Mighty Ducks mm. is much more kid focused. Yeah. So he really latched onto that. Okay. He loved it from really? beginning to end. He My got gosh. into it. He was saying quack, quack, <laughs> quack. When they would win the That's games, awesome. he was getting excited. <laughs> he was kicking his feet. Oh like he was, I have never seen him that engaged with a movie before ever. Wow. He freaking loved the Mighty Ducks. Okay. Um, so that was just a joy because I was like, if Man. he doesn't like this, I'm not going to try to like say, hey, watch this thing that I used to like because I don't want to be that dad. Like that's yeah. a, that's annoying. But yeah, um, he did end up liking it quite a bit. So wow. that was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, when I, you know, turned it off, you know, obviously Disney Plus served up 
a thumbnail for the second one. He's like, oh, there's a second one. I was like, yeah, there's, yeah. I think like four, like but three or four. Yeah. Yeah. The second one I think is pretty good though. So I think so. That might be, remember. that might be the one with, I think, I, that, I think Keenan Thompson's in that one. I don't think I've seen these since I was probably Archer's age. I don't think I had either. Really? No. I mean, I remember I saw it a lot when I was that age though. Like yeah. a lot. Hmm. I did remember there were some moments that I'm like, Oh God, because you know, like in home alone, when, they realized they were late and it speeds up the footage and they're all running around the house. Dun, 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 you know? Yeah. Um, that was a very early 90s thing. Yeah. The sped up running footage. They don't do that anymore in any movie. No, because it's They dumb. did it in Christmas Story. <laughs> they did it in Home Alone. Mm -hmm. And they did it in this. And I'm like, oh, 90s. You're like, wow, and it dates it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but... Uh, other than that, it it, it held it up held pretty, pretty well. You okay. know, you got Gordon Bombay in his limo with his car phone, you know. <laughs> It's awesome. With that big, love like old tech. Oh yeah, so great. I yeah. love the old tech alerts. Nice. Uh, so that was fun. Also, with my son this weekend, uh, out of nowhere, he just said he looks at me. We're at the table, and I guess I was probably sewing something, and he was playing on his tablet. And he just looks up and he says, "Nerf battle," <laughs> and I was like, ah. and then I just kind of replayed my head, like, "Have I said no to this recently?" Yes, mm. and I said no to it again. I'm like, "Ah, crap. Yeah, I'm due." And I said, okay. So out of nowhere, oh we just went upstairs. <laughs> We've got a whole process now. So oh boy. Um, we did something different, something similar. So I have a I have a song that I play through the little um, Bluetooth boom box upstairs. Nice. It's the theme song from Metal Gear Solid 3 okay. by composer Harry Gregson Williams. Nice. He composed The Rock. So if you remember the the oh, um, theme from that, it's yeah. So he yeah. So he did this. It is just as epic. Has nice. some highs and lows. It's a great like mm. Nerf battle song. Okay, and it's like six and a half minutes long. So Perfect. good good length. Yeah, we did two songs of that. Okay, I was tired after the first one. Uh, this time we filled all the Nerf guns pretty much and just laid them around the upstairs, you know, oh, okay. so rather than like having to hunt and like, oh, stop, 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 gotta, gotta reload. Mm. We filled them up. We put them in different rooms. We'd always have something ready to go. Wow. Um, I have only ever bought one Nerf gun for myself so that I can defend myself against my son. Okay. Um, it's, it looks like a pump action grenade launcher. Okay. Like you pump, pump, shoot, pump, pump, shoot. Yeah. It's like that foregrip yeah. that pumps. Okay. Um, but the drum shoots out the dart and then it enters a um, a chamber. Yeah. So it goes out of the drum. There's a gap between the drum and the barrel. Yeah, yeah. And then that gap creates a clog because there's mm. if, if it's just a little bit off and it doesn't go oh, right yeah. into the barrel. It'll like hit the yeah. chamber. Yeah. So it's not great. It looks cool, <laughs> but it's like, it's th that's, like my, that's like my gun and it's like, it sucks. <laughs> so well, I kind of have to I'm, rely on the little his leftover pistols that he doesn't want. <laughs> so I get lit up. He's yeah. got, he, he, he got probably a, loves it more. For oh, that reason. he he got, yeah. he has an electronic one that he just, he hits one button. It starts going oh, and it's yeah. motorized. And then he just goes like, pop, 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 pop. He's got a chain gun. That's like, chuk, chuk, boom, chuk, chuk, boom. And it's got a, a belt magazine. Wow. So I get destroyed, you wow. know? And of course I react better. Like when I get hit, I'm like, Oh, you know, if I get hit in the wrist, I'm like, Oh, I'll throw, throw my gun. He's all like, <laughs> he doesn't care. He's just like yeah. running around. I'm like, man, I hit you do something. <laughs> yeah. He's like, what do, what do you want me to do? Fall down? Like, yeah. Yeah. I'm acting like a goober over here. Yeah. So, uh, last night he went to a friend's house for a sleepover mm -hmm. and uh, my wife and I went out to a restaurant. We went to uh pinking that Chinese restaurant at, oh, yeah. uh, um, haven't been there in years. Yeah. Um, it was good. Yeah, it was good. Uh, it was cold. So we got in there, got some hot tea, mm. got some soup. It was delightful. It was just what we needed. Nice. And of course, every time he's over at a friend's house, we just go to Target by ourselves. So it's it's different. It's yep. like Target hits different when you don't have a kid. Oh, for sure. And it's delightful. We just we just walked around and we spent a lot of time in the ladies section, a little bit of time in the guys section, and then we passed the toy section. And she's thinking that like, oh, we don't have Archer with us. We can just bypass this toy section. I was like, honey, what, what are we doing? We get the- We get to look at the toys she's that like, we what? want now. We, we, we spend so much time in the toy aisle when Archer's here. Why can't we just <laughs> skip it? And I said, didn't you say you needed to get some makeup? You're gonna subject me to that. <laughs> so mm. I said, you go get your makeup. I'm gonna hang out in the toy section. Nice. The thing about the makeup section at Target is this, Brian. I am, we, we start on the right side of the Target with the clothes. Okay. We do a lap and we come around, makeup's at the end. Okay, yep. And we have a game plan for the most part. We got one or two things we need to pick up. And then I'm done. I'm like, I'm over target. I'm overstimulated. 
Oh. I'm done. I'm mentally checked out. You got like a Pavlovian effect to the yeah. makeup? No, section? no, no. This is before makeup. This is pre-makeup. Oh. I'm done. We're like, all right, come on. We've got what we needed. Let's let's go ahead and go. And then on our way out, that's when oh, it that's happens. She wants to go to the makeup. That's okay. when it happens. She's like, oh wait, I need a couple, I need, I need, I need some eyeliner. I'm like, ah. Oh! oh, and you're like already. If it happens first, yes, exactly. Mm. And in my mind, I'm done with Target. But then the makeup section, it's like a, it's like quicksand, mm. where it's like I walk past. And I'm like, are we able? Are we going to be able to walk past it? Are we going to be able to? Walk? No, we're not. She mm. needs some concealer, you know. Interesting. So you have like a path that you take through Target? Like, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I don't, I don't have a path. You don't have a path? No, no. Just chaos. Yeah, kind of. All right, do y'all have a path in Target? Do y'all have a Target path? I need to know this. That's what we need. Yeah, I don't have a path to most of the stores I go to, except the grocery store. The grocery store. You start with the produce. I make my grocery list yeah. in order of where it's going to be. It's like, it's like when we pull orders here, mm -hmm. it's like one pass. I'm getting everything one at yeah. a time because grocery stores, I don't want to be there any longer. Now. Oh, so, no. Amen. I, but like Home Depot, like I'm going in there. I'm going to oh, sure. go all over the place. For sure. Everything. Yeah. Um, but I went ahead and bought myself a Nerf gun. It's, oh. You know, nice, solid $14.99 kind of pump action shotgun looking thing. All right. Five shots, and but it doesn't shoot all five at once. It's like one, two, three, four, five, all from like a, you know, okay. kind of like honeycomb sort of barrel up at the yeah. front. Like that works. That's hmm. all I need. It's coming right okay. out the front. No fancy nonsense. So I feel like I'll so be. So these tear guns all use the same darts, or are they like all different? No, they darts all use and... the same standard Nerf darts. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I'm I'm picturing like each gun has different darts. Oh God, and no. them all mixed up. And... No, there are some Nerf guns that shoot balls. Yeah. But those those are like for older. They're like more intense. Right? I think so, but also like they're the perfect size for a dog to swallow. Oh yeah. Like the darts, if a dog gets a hold of those, they'll chew it up. Right. But like they're not gonna try to just swallow the dart but those balls like they're just yeah. the right kind of scary size i don't yeah. want to i don't want those okay, that around makes sense. That makes sense. now granted we always do this upstairs where the dogs are not allowed but still still those balls um, can roll down the stairs yeah yeah. yeah so i have a funny story to talk since you were talking about nerf yeah. guns and all this kind of stuff so when i was a kid i was probably nine or ten years old you know around archer's age mm -hmm. and I wanted to, you know, I was like making a Christmas list or something like that. And, you know, this is like back in the day when you would like watch a TV commercial and then want that toy. Oh. Even though the it was Nerf terrible, guns of the 90s. The Nerf guns are like, oh. remember the game Crossfire? Crossfire! I had that disappointing, super disappointing. Oh, in Crossfire real life. was awesome. We played it a lot. That was very disappointing in real life. Well, because you didn't get to like blast your opponent off into. Yeah, Explosion. you just like click the trigger and a ball like rolls down and maybe hits a little doodad. Oh, it gets, it's fired. There's some propellant there, man. It doesn't just Not roll. Not what I was expecting. Let's put it that way. But anyway, this isn't about crossfire. <laughs> but I wanted one of those guns that you're talking about that has like you pull the trigger and it winds up the motor. And it had like this big tube filled with balls. And these were balls that were like, like big. What? And it would just like auto fire and just like. Oh my <laughs> God, I never saw that. Yeah. And so it was like in a magazine for some, I don't know, store. And I wanted it so bad. And there was a misprint in the ad. They misprinted the age that the thing was recommended for. It was supposed to be, I think, eight and up or 10 and up or something like that. But they had printed three and up. So when I like told my parents, like, I really want this thing. And my dad was like, this says it's for three and up. And I was like, yeah, but it's three and up. <laughs> right. You know, like my kid logic. I am up. I was like, I am up. So now it's like an inside joke in our whole family. It's like three and up. So anyway. Did you get I, it? I thought I would share that. Uh, I did end up getting it and it was kind of cool. But then I kind of, you know, I didn't have anybody to like play with. So yeah. I was just like, had this gun. I'd be like, Pfft. And I was like, okay, that's cool. Now there's, I'm going to spend the next five Couldn't minutes. Couldn't shoot your sister? No, nah, That's man, what little brothers sister, are supposed to do. No, nah, man, I was I was in line. My, yeah. my older sister, she made me know who was boss. Yeah. No, I mean, she was really nice, but like I didn't have any animosity. Yeah, you were her. not a troublemaker. I was not a troublemaker no. at all. So I would like set up action figures and shoot them and stuff like yeah. that. But then I would spend the next five minutes picking up balls everywhere. And Well, when we were kids, Nerf <laughs> I was not quickly. like, you didn't have like the little Nerf things. Like Chad and I had the um, Nerf bows. But the darts on those things were like oh, they're huge. Yeah, like yeah. two feet long. And they didn't. They were not accurate in any way whatsoever. No, no. It was like they went on like a post. Yeah, a post that had two little holes yeah. in it. It'd go like. Poof. Yeah. Yeah. Crappy. Yeah. And I did have a Nerf slingshot that like you'd pull back a, an elastic, and then there was this disc. Yeah. And the disc would slam into a ball and like 
Oh, kind okay. of flick the ball it's kind of out cool. of the Nerf. Yeah. Okay. And there were some cool ones. Like my brother had one that like could had a mirror on it. You could turn the barrel to the side and like shoot around oh, corners. I, remember. I think I had that one too. Yeah, he had that, that one. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so all that, See, of I had, course. I had an older sister and I had no brothers. Yeah. So it was like, I would do dance routines and play dress up and, yeah. you know, play with dolls slash action figures. Yeah. And then I got into Lego and stuff like that. So I just, I didn't have anybody to like participate in with the like it was always me wanting to pretend like my brother Mm. never really wanted to pretend it wasn't until my dad Mm. got remarried and we gained another brother that i was able to do that more because like me and zach big imaginations love to pretend like love to be characters love to dress up chad was just kind of like all right that's fine okay (laughs) we'll do that that's more like the older sibling i was like who do you want to be like i don't care (laughs) like how how about you be this like okay but then zach came along and he was like that's me with rachel with anything that yeah. involves like that that type of yeah. scenario. Yeah. I'm like, what about this? She's like, all right, fine. Yeah, no. that's me and Shannon too, of course. <laughs> um, but so I, of course I'm thinking Nerf now. I'm like, yeah. I told myself just from an organizational standpoint, I was going to go buy some pegboard and put all of his Nerf guns on the wall Ooh. because they're in this giant bucket and it's just like overflowing. You yeah. can't find anything. So I'm like, let me just put them on the wall. And of course I was like, you know what? Maybe let, let me go on Reddit and see what the Nerf community is like. Oh, there are there there are there are there is a limit to my rabbit hole curiosity, mm-hmm. and I found it yep. in like five seconds. There's probably people with like sliding walls and stuff like a James well, Bond it's, film. It's or not something. just that; it's all modding. Like they're like, okay, oh, yeah. I open this up and replace the cage of this with the thing. I'm like, oh, what's replace like? like with bigger motors oh, and all that kind of stuff. It's insane. They're oh, like yeah. hodgepodge. I'm like, okay, nope, gone. Bye. They're like, well, you need to get waffle headed darts. I'm like, nah, okay, we're. <laughs> We're not doing that. So, Is that really a thing? Yes. Apparently, the Nerf darts don't fly true. It's better to have replace all your darts and use oh, like your... a golf ball, where it's like kind of like that. Or I guess I don't <laughs> know, man. It scared me off. I was like, nope, <laughs> not doing that. Oh, not wow. doing that. It's good to know you have a limit. Right. You know, I thought the same somewhere. thing. I'm like, you yeah. know what? Good job, Drew. Yeah. Good job. I'm with you. I do the same thing. Restraint. I'm you like, do have a limit. Yeah. I'm like, I wonder if there's more into that. And you're like, oop, nope, 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 nope. Okay. Bye, bye. Too much. Yep. Um, I started a new video game uh, called Gotham Knights. It's a Batman video game where you okay. play as Batman's uh, like sidekick entourage. Mm. So no Batman. Mm. He plays Nightwing, Batgirl, Red Hood, and Robin. Okay. Which Nightwing has been like long time my favorite superhero. Like yeah, him and yeah. Green Lantern as a kid, like those were my boys. Okay. Nightwing. I probably have the most Nightwing comics of mm. any, any comic. Like I have. I, I know nothing about Nightwing. He's He was the first Robin. And then he stopped being oh. Robin, became Nightwing, and Batman got a new Robin. Oh, okay. So that's pretty much it. All right. Moved to like moved if 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 New York is Gotham City, he moved down to Jersey, essentially. The, okay. fi- the fictional Jersey. Gotcha. Um, which is called Bloodhaven. Bloodhaven. It's actually it's it's spelled Sounds cooler than Gotham. It's spelled Blurhaven. Oh. Which I always pronounce Blurhaven because oh. it's got a U and an umlaut. Right. And then later, you know, I hear, you know, more people in the nerds feel like it's Bloodhaven. I'm like, oh, no, it's not. It's Bloodhaven. Mm. It's got an umlaut. Come on, people. Yeah. You're trying to make it all sound tough. Like, I get that's <clears throat> what they were doing, but all my childhood, I, in my head, I was reading Bloodhaven. Well, anyway, um, I was just thrilled to have a Nightwing video game. Yeah. Pretty much. Like, this is, cool. he's not a super popular character. So, yeah. being able to play him running around cities, fighting bad guys, nice. it's been a blast. That's fun. Um, so, that's been fun. And then, uh, like I said, Archer had a sleepover. Um, New Year, New Year, uh, New Year's Eve. Um, I was kind of on dog watch for my brother. My brothers went out of town because they like football. Okay. They went to watch the 49ers play in DC. Um, so oh. they were on the away side, okay, rooting against the Washington Commanders. I think yes, Commanders. Um, so they were enjoying that. But I was since my brother lives near me, I was watching his dogs while they were away, letting them out and stuff. So I okay. didn't really. They got home in enough time for me to go to a New Year's thing, but I had, Archer mm-hmm. was already kind of ready for bed, so I was like, nah, it's fine. Yeah. Shannon went. Um, she came home and uh, coincidentally got home at exactly 12 o'clock, so we were able to kiss right at the stroke of midnight. Yay. We had a little bit of... we had. I bought two bottles of sparkling nonsense, mm-hmm. one for the Pencast last week and then one for us on New Year's Eve, so we were able to have some nice. Welch's rosé grape something. Nice. Um. So apart from that, we finished um, our second or third uh, viewing of Parks and Rec. And uh, I love that show more every time. 
And the it thing, the thing that I love the most about it is that the whole final season is one finale. Mm. Like they didn't, like it's not just like a regular show, and then the, like the last two episodes are like finale. Right. It, the whole final season yeah. is wrap up. Right. And like, I can't think of another series that did it that right. Hmm. The whole final season is just a a goodbye and a thank you. Yeah. And it just it, putting it in a nice pretty bow. Yeah. Just fantastic. So good show. Love that. So it was a solid weekend, solid nice. week. Um, That's awesome. And uh, looking forward to a nice, happy 2024. Yeah. 2023 ending strong. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Ready for my stuff? I am so ready for your stuff. Well, what kind of stuff you got? I got to close out 2023 really strong because the hot water heater went out at our office. We have a couple of them, but over we have two sets of bathrooms. Yeah. There's a hot water heater. It's like one of those little 10 gallon ones like you'd have in an apartment. I'd never seen one until they brought it over to replace yeah. it. I was like, look at that little thing. It looks yeah. like R2D2. It's up there like in the ceiling above yeah. our bathrooms. Um, but yeah, it died a couple of weeks ago and we tried to schedule to get the plumbers out to take care of it. And because it's holiday time, they misscheduled and all this kind of stuff. So we ended up having to get somebody in because um, we tried to shut off the valve, but it didn't shut off all the way and the valve kind of broke. So what started out as somewhat of a simple thing got way more complicated as soon as that valve broke. Um, so we had to basically, you know, it was like the element had, had worn out inside the thing. So water was actually leaking out of the heating element because the thing had rusted out. Uh, and of course, we're like tenants in this building. This is this was installed well before we ever got into this building. I didn't even know that thing was up there uh, until a couple of years ago when the other one went bad mm. and we had to replace that. And I thought we had replaced this one, but we didn't. Uh, but now we have. We replaced both of them now. Um, anyway, that's all boring stuff. But uh, basically, we had plumbers come in and we had to deal with all of that. And then as soon as we got that taken care of, finally, we... Um, Basically, in order to do that, they had to shut off the water to not just our building, but basically the entire block that we're on. So several other businesses that are on here. I didn't know that. There's like a water main shut off for like the whole block. So <laughs> it was kind of a thing just to even get that coordinated. And this is all around Christmas time. So trying to get a hold of people. and So when our business had no water, no nobody did in our immediate vicinity. I didn't know that. Yeah, that was oh, part of the fun of coordinating wow. all that. That's why I was walking around the building. Like, that was like two hours. Yeah. So was, yeah. So that was fun. Um, but anyway, we got that taken care of. That's all fine. But something fun that happened, a little side note for you all. This is probably irrelevant information, but we ended up after they did that and they turned the water back on, water heater works great and everything. But then we had several of our faucets that stopped working because for whatever reason, when they shut the water off at the main and then turned it back on, I guess it just like jarred a bunch of stuff loose in the pipes. And we had all this like gunk that clogged up the filters inside of the sink. Like little so that's what happened. That, was, that was what was going on in the kitchen. Yep. And that happened when they replaced the other one. I eventually remembered, uh, but this was like three years ago or something. We had this replaced. Yeah. And how often do you remember weird stuff like that? Never. So we were like, I was so confused because I was like, this sink over here, like the cold water is working fine, but the hot water is not working. And this, and I was like, I was so confused because I could not put together why some faucets were working and others weren't. Standard CEO duties. Yeah, of course. And this is, you know, thank well, to backpedal a little bit. So we were supposed to go out of town and see Rachel's sister's family post Christmas. Rachel ended up being sick. Her sister ended up being sick. So that didn't happen. So because that didn't happen, I was here and we had all this plumbing stuff going on. So it kind of worked out because I was able to deal with all this stuff. But basically I spent my day with the plumbing stuff in the morning there and then all afternoon hunting around trying to figure out what the heck uh, was going on with all these random sinks. But then once I realized, oh, it's all the filters are clogged went around fix all those. So fun fact, in case you ever have to shut off your water main in whatever building you're in, and then randomly sinks and faucets and stuff stop working, check your check your aerators, check your filters. So that happened. Um, and then through that whole process, I was like trying to get like the pliers and like all this kind of stuff and like, you know, electrical tape and duct tape, all these like random things. I just realized like how sad a state of affairs. We've been in this building, this building for six and a half years and we have like a tool room but it's like nobody really kind of like owns that management of that tool room. And as I was running around dealing with all this random stuff, I was just like, oh God, I don't even have like, I didn't have an adjustable wrench. Like I didn't have the wrench for the size of the thing that I needed to undo certain things. And I was like, this is, 
Yeah. The, as a guy with 35 hammers and a lot of other tools, I was like, I'm so well equipped at home. This makes me sad to not have just the basics here. Yeah. Well, you tried you to know? do that one time. Like you made like. I've done it at other times. You, yeah. You've but, made like multiple toolboxes that yeah. a, at one point had like the basics in them. Sure. Sure. But I don't think they had like adjustable wrenches in there. Yeah. We don't. It was have... like hammer, screwdriver. Yeah. And we still have a lot of that. But it's like, you know, you have drill bits and stuff like that. But then you know, a drill bit breaks and, you know, all that kind of stuff God. or gets mixed up. So we have like so the many, drill bit situation so was many terrible. partial things. And I'm just like, nobody's really just like gone through that. So I'm kind of low key, just kind of doing that as I have some downtime. Cause like I'm the most passionate one about tools and all that kind of stuff. So speaking of all, tools, I, yeah. I have a question for you. Oh, okay. I discovered an ax recently. Okay. That I had never seen before. And I'm like, I wonder if Brian has heard of this. Okay. It's called the chopper. The chopper. Yeah. It's an okay. axe that has hinges and metal on oh, the head. Oh, yes. Have you seen that? I have seen this. So I've the, never used it. These little hinges, apparently, once the axe head penetrates a log that you're splitting, okay. these little tabs get hit, and then it opens up like that to then separate the log upon impact. Oh, I've never seen this specific one. Okay. So... I was just curious. I was just wondering. I'm like, I wonder if, I mean, you've got a bunch of crazy axes. I, I do have a bunch of crazy axes. You need a chopper. I don't have a chopper. I don't know if it actually works or if it's a gimmick. I, that, I think we need to find out. You need I, to go, do you ever do, do a lot of log splitting or is it I mostly just like hacking them into chunks? Well, I don't have a wood burning stove. Or so you've got no like reason that. to split them. Really. I don't have a lot of reason. I have split wood. I also have a log splitter. So mm -hmm. that now, why would I ever split by hand? When for, you get it, because you, you'll have a exercise. chopper. I have lots of ways to get exercise around <laughs> my place. Um, it is really good exercise, though, actually. But anyway, uh, never never use the chopper. All right. Well, yeah. I'll, uh, I'm not going to get you one. Just, okay. just, just you know. Fair enough. You have a wood, wood splitter. You don't need a chopper. But I was just curious if you had ever heard have, of one. I have a whole like axe collection. That's kind of another thing that axes and. Well, hatchets. if you need, if you need the chopper, might be good for a collection. You know, just to have up on the wall. It's not. Something that would be hard to convince me to get into. Let me put it that way. <laughs> All right, continue. Sorry. I'll pull it up later and I'll probably get obsessed with it. <laughs> anyway. um, so yeah, um, so I, I got to do a little shopping for, for, the, Good. for the company. I'm sure you hated that. I really did, yeah. But I mean, honestly, we just needed some like basic sets of pliers and stuff like that. You know, stuff that's like, we had some pliers, but they were like kind of small. And it's like when I was trying to wrap around one of the like pipe fittings and stuff like that, I didn't have anything large enough to actually get all the way around it. Mm. And it's these tiny little things in my big hands. And I was just like, no, I need some like proper yeah. things. So I went out and got some of that stuff. No hammers though. We have hammers. So I didn't buy any hammers. So the hammer collection did not increase, but we have like, we have a lot of hammers here too. We had at least already. one person write in and said they wanted a, you know, kind of step-by-step -step overview of all your hammers, but I'm oh not, gosh. I'm not going to tell you that because <laughs> I could do that. No, you couldn't. I could. No. It, would, it would be long. Mm -hmm. It would be long. Um, okay. What else did I do? So that was last week. And then we had the the weekend. Um, so I did some some more creaking. You did some creaking. Did some more creaking. Clearing stuff out. You got your waders on? Yep. Yeah. Waiting. The weather was actually really nice. So it was very enjoyable being out there. So I was just, you know, out yeah, there. Yeah, it was good weather this weekend. Yeah, it was really oh, well, nice. One too hot, one too rainy, cold. Rainy, but... Well, I didn't go out there in the rain. Okay. I wasn't that dedicated. Gotcha. But, you know, I worked around that. But the rain kept it, you know, moderately it cool. It kept it moderate. I yeah. mean, it was like in the 50s. Yeah. You know, which is Solid. great for I love it. wading around and all that. Um, so, yeah, just clearing out the creek slowly but surely. Um, oh, we also flew Archer's drone. My, my dad got him a drone, a little, oh. you know, cheapo Chinese yeah, yeah. drone. But we uh, we went out in the to the this field behind his school and we flew that. I was just thinking about, like, wet ground. And it made me think, like, yeah, oh. we were out there. He... Nice. Flew it into a tree, but it survived. Um, and uh, no, he had some fun with that. I have destroyed a drone. I know you have. I yeah. flew it into the side of my house I know. at full speed. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're not the only Brian I know that's done that. <laughs> that's true. Oh, boy. Anyway, uh, sorry. DV, I just, that's because I try to get like panning shots, you know, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to like strafe with the drone mm -hmm. as I'm turning and then I lose, I lose my sense of direction. And I hit, I hit things. I've run into so many trees. Anyway, um, so yeah, I was out there creaking quite a bit, enjoying the outdoors. Do you have a solution to, to your bridge yet? Um, working on it. Okay. If you no, might, you might want to check the, the comments from last week. Someone did send you instructions on how to build an easy bridge. I don't know. Okay. I, I didn't click on it because I don't well, care. I definitely but... <laughs> know how I could build a bridge. I don't know if I want to do a bridge. Someone suggested a railroad bridge. Wow. Okay. <laughs> 
I mean, that's essentially what I'd have to build. It would have to be pretty hardcore. Yeah. But using like railroad ties, like you can buy those. I think so. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. That would definitely be sturdy enough. And they're really weatherproof too. That actually would be a pretty good option if I can get them long enough. I'm not sure how long railroad ties are. Anyway, this is boring. Um, so as I was creaking out there. I Other was, than the, the creek stuff though, that'll the creek be interesting. Stuff, let's get back to it. No, no. <laughs> that's really all I have to say about it. It was, I like even tried to take some pictures and I was like this, What's kind of defeating about this is like, I'm doing all this work. It will have an effect, but it doesn't really look like much. And even if I take pictures, you're like, oh, I guess there's some fewer brush. But mostly I'm like digging up sand out of the creek and digging logs out from underneath the sand. You can't really tell what I've done, but I'm out there. I've worked really hard. <laughs> and like I come in, I'm exhausted me, and sweaty. This and, is not just a picture of mud. This is a picture of yeah, labor. So I didn't even bother taking pictures for the pen cast. Let, it doesn't me, look let, like anything. Let me tell you how insane our audience is. Not, not only do they care about this, but one person said, well, Brian, didn't you at one point have a decomposed log that caused a sinkhole in your driveway? Won't your log grave eventually cause, you know, a sinkhole? And I'm like, all right, A, why are you talking to Brian about log graves? Don't encourage him. B, <laughs> how do you remember that yeah. the dry, that the old rotten stump was the cause of a sinkhole in his driveway? Yeah. I don't even pay attention to you that much. That definitely happened. Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, I, yeah. They're into this. Y'all are invested. Madness. You're my people. Y'all are crazy. Yes, that will happen with the the, <laughs> the log grave. Eventually. It will definitely happen. <laughs> but that was part of the... I guess just don't asphalt over it. Well, it's going to... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is out in the corner of the yeah. yard. It doesn't really matter. And then I'll just cover it with more dirt. Like, <laughs> right. have piles of dirt that are yeah. there. Um, no, but it's like I could like turn it into a really nice like garden or something like that. Yeah. It's technically called hugel culture, yeah. where you bury logs and it turns in compost and all that. But... I don't know. It's a lot of logs. They're very big. It's probably going to take like a decade for it to, yeah, to I've, decompose. Yeah, like I told you, I've got that in my raised bed and yeah. I'll put my tomato cages in every year and clunk. Like it, yeah. there's still logs. Yeah. Especially because like when you dig, especially like six feet underground, like it's not getting that hot under there. Like stuff's not breaking down very much. So yeah. these logs might stay there for a while. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Um, okay. What else is going on? So as I was creaking quite a bit, <laughs> I was listening to Hardcore History oh, by yes. Dan Carlin. It's a podcast. If you think we do some long podcasts, good Lord. This guy, I mean, his average podcast is probably like three or four hours. I want to say the World War One series was about 24 hours long. Whew. It's long. I don't know how many parts it was, but I remember it being about 24 hours in total. I probably, I probably listened to about 20 hours of his podcast yeah. in the last maybe week. He, like, he, a he does a lot of prep work and scripting Very and production. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's like months in between each. It's like one listening, of these listening to a documentary. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I listened to one about uh, Sparta and Persia. Mm. All about that. That was that was like a four parter or something like that. It was awesome. Um, one about the Roman conquest of ancient Gaul. What was the Sparta one called? Uh, was it about King of Kings? Yes, I yes. I had that one on my list. Never listened to it, but yeah, it's it was about it was about Xerxes. Yeah. 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 It spanned quite a bit. Talked about, but th a lot that, of that that is referring to Xerxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You'll you'll like that one. Okay, it's like a three parter or something like that. Oh, it's that's like, not bad. It's like ten hours worth. That's of, not bad. Stuff. That's lightweight stuff compared to some of his other stuff. Well, then I listened to one about the development of nuclear weapons in the Cold War. <gasps> that one was really good too. Oh, in the Cold War. Yeah, it, leading into the Cold War. Oh, lead, oh okay, some gotcha, of that. Gotcha, yeah. Gotcha. And then I just am in the process of finishing um, the Asia Pacific Battles of World War II, which is a six parter, mm. which is probably like 20 hours just in itself. And it's it's intense, man. It's intense. But he's just such a good storyteller. He is. He really and, is. He's got a great yeah. voice. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm appreciating that. My father, my grandfather was a World War II veteran. He was at Pearl Harbor when it got oh, bombed. Wow. So I can appreciate that a little more. But it's just very fascinating. I appreciate things way more than I did. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad we live now. Like whenever I think like, oh, there's a lot going on. I'm like, yeah, not comparatively. No. We got it pretty good. It's, I mean, there were any time period will have its horrors, yeah. but it, it, it's always, it always gets worse the farther back you go. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And that's just what we know. Yeah, it's exactly. Probably, probably that's, that's another huge that. thing. Like, yeah, I always get freaked out. Like thinking about people on the frontier, like, Anybody could just like oh, be terrible. Anybody could just run up to your house and kill you and run away and yeah. no one would catch him. Yeah. That's horrifying. Yeah, basically. Ugh. Happened all the time. Ugh. Yep. If you didn't die of the disease that you probably had and had to live with. Yeah. Yeah. God. 
like me, like I had bad eyesight. Like my eyesight was pretty terrible. If I'd been born 300 years ago, I would have just be like totally disabled. Like I'd be blind. Like what would I, you know, and there'd be no way to correct it. So that would suck. Yeah. Anyway, um, let's see here. What else did I do? Um, did some woodworking. Nice. So my in-laws came down for a couple of days, came down like Christmas afternoon. That's always a solid a project catalyst for you. Yep. So it was nice because we actually got to complete a project. So when my father-in-law comes down, we'll usually like get to work on something for a bit, but we don't always get it finished. Yeah. You know, because it's like if you, you come down for a few days at a time, you might like start something, but then you got to glue it and it's got to stay yeah. and then you got to sand it. I'm finish trying to think it, what, what project kind of did, did you have going on that you wasn't finished? So I had a cherry tree that was in the process of kind of dying and stuff like that. So, and, but it had a couple of burls on it. Mm -hmm. So I cut down the tree and I took those cherry burls and we wanted to try turning them on the lathe, but I'd never turned something from green wood, you know, like, like chopped down a tree, mm -hmm. tried to turn something. When that happens, the wood is like entirely wet. It's totally saturated and it, it dries and it shrinks and it moves and warps and cracks and all that kind of stuff. So turning from green wood is kind of a whole thing. So I'd only ever turned like pens and small stuff that was all from like hard finished wood. Mm -hmm. um, this is the first time like taking it from like the very start of the process. So my father and I, and I started kind of getting into that. We like basically like rough turned a bunch of stuff, but then we had to like let it sit for months while it dried out. What, was, what, was the, what were the rough shapes? Um, we tried like a vessel and a couple other like, you know, like bud vases and like, oh, you cool. know, some of the small stuff. Um, so we, we had one that had some cracks in it, but it was like this beautiful, like really gnarly, crazy looking burl, which is, it looks really cool, but it's awful to try to work with because the grain is going every which direction. It's spinning, you know, you got to sharpen the tools like crazy. So we had one that we kind of rough turned and it warped like crazy. So we had to like, but he wanted to kind of finish it up. So it was all dry basically. So we threw was it, it, was threw it, it back relatively in the thin shape. Um, it was probably about maybe five inches in diameter. Was by it the time a vessel? I got to it. Yeah, it was like a vase. Okay, you know, it's maybe like eight inches tall. Okay, by like maybe and then five like what did it like warp around the rim? Well, originally it was like much bigger, uh -huh. but it warped so bad we ended up having to like shrink it quite a bit. Really? Yeah, like the whole thing warped. Oh yeah. Oh wow. Like we had we had turned it and it was probably like inch and a half thick on its edges. That's very thick. But it warped, but like the whole top like warped over kind of to the side. Really? Yeah. That much? So we ended up having to get it to be like a quarter inch thick maybe. Oh, wow. In order to get it actually round. I'm surprised again. something that thick was able to move so much. Oh yeah. Tree, well, because it was a burl too, like the grain is going every which direction. The The natural tension that's happening with that tree is pulling it in like every which direction. So yeah. you don't know what's gonna happen to it by the time it dries out. A lot out. of Newtonian nonsense going on in there. A lot of stuff happening in there. So that was a new experience for me. Yeah. But I was really, I was like, we'll throw that thing on the lathe. And I was like, I don't even know if it's going to like mm -hmm. stay together as one piece. Can it, that's can it ever like explode? Yes. Because it seems like, well, what, was what you're describing <laughs> is like, you've got an organic force kind of like pushing and pulling against itself at all yeah. times. Mm -hmm. That sounds like something yeah. rife for... Okay. It explodes. It yeah. happens a lot. Okay. Like it is a thing. All right, great. Cause that, yeah. it sounds volatile. I have this like metal like cage thing that attaches to my lathe so that if the whole thing explodes, it won't like smash you in the face. I have to wear like a full face shield mm. with like plexiglass, like impact resistant plexiglass in front of my face in case it blows up in my face. You know, it'd be safer it if like you could find something <laughs> that looked like Burl, but wasn't Burl. So I suggest next time you find something mm. Burlesque. <laughs> uh, no, just kidding. Wow. <clears throat> wow. I was waiting Very for that good. one. Uh, but anyway, so we ended up- Nothing uh, exploded. Nothing exploded. Great. It all worked out. And we actually turned the thing down, finished it. It took some doing, but you know, we did it. So, at what, so point it does, good. Do, at what point, like, it only ever explodes while you're cutting, right? It doesn't ever, yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't just combust by itself. I mean, no, it's not, okay. it's not moving that fast. Where okay. it, would do. It, would, it would like split and crack if it was going to do that. Okay. It, wouldn't, it wouldn't. So is the danger of splitting and cracking over? Like, can, can you? No, no, it could still do it. It could still happen. Okay. Well, it's got to be like fully, fully dry. Right. But, you know, there's always kind of that risk that if it's not fully dry. And then stabilize if you never, ever want it to crack, right? Well, you can never fully stabilize wood. Like it continues to absorb and like release moisture. So stabilized wood is a myth. Yeah, basically. <gasps> well, you can 
stabilize. You can like inject resin into the wood. I thought that's what stabilizing was. It. Well, yeah. I mean, that's we didn't do that with this. Oh, no, because that's that's a whole thing. Yeah, it's a very involved process. I've done it before, but it is not easy to do, and it involves chemicals that are pretty gnarly as really? well. Really? Yeah. Oh. And you have to like you have to have like a vacuum chamber. Because you got to get... You have to like impregnate the wood with yeah. resin. So you got to suck all the air out. It's got to get in the crannies and the nooks. Yep. Mm. You got to you gotta use a vacuum chamber to suck all the air out to get the resin in there. And then you have to switch off and pressurize it to really drive it into the do wood. Do you have a vacuum chamber? And then you got to... Yeah, I do. You do? Yeah. How That's long have you one. had that? It's a small one. Well, this Since is the... back in my pen making days. Yeah? Because I would do that. I would get, you know, wood that was like... Part, had voids and was mm -hmm. like, you know, burly pieces and stuff like that. And I would fill it with resin and I would have to kind of do that stuff. Oh. So you do that and then sometimes you have to bake it too. So you got to like vacuum suck it and then you pressurize it and then you have to bake it. Oh. It's a whole process. Oh my God. And then you do all that and then nobody wants to buy your pens. And then you're just like, this is a what would you know about that? Fat freaking waste of time. <laughs> time to retail. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So now I just have that vacuum. Thing. I got a vacuum pump and I got all this stuff, man. I got way more tools than I should. I don't believe it for fun. a second. Yeah. Now I will say I was shocked at how reasonable your hammer collection ended up being. Like I was fully prepared to admonish what? you at at infinitum. Well, keep but, in mind that was unintentional. These are just hammers I happened to buy. I don't think it was <laughs> unintentional. I think that like you, well, they all had a purpose. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's my thing. It's like I was not expecting so much purpose. Mm -hmm. I was like primed and armed to ridicule, and I found myself ridicul ridiculous. <laughs> ridicule less yeah without ridicule yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well thank you drew um anyway so i'll probably post pictures here um of the cherry burl vase but anyway did that um also did some more woodworking because joseph has so many legos and he's at the point now where he's building things that he's proud of and doesn't want to take apart and now he is just drowning in lego builds i bet you wished now. he did that like five years ago i know with those expensive he sets it. you he were buying i bet too. he does he has them he has the millennium falcon somewhere in his room in a thousand pieces the smaller millennium falcon not still the big, the big still one. you're still talking probably oh, 100 yeah. bucks oh yeah oh yeah um so anyway but uh yeah he was like i need more shelves and we had some of these like you know things you get at target or whatever but they're like they're like little shelves, like like uh, what do they call like knickknack shelves or yeah. whatever. And I'm like, I'm like Joseph, this is not going to cut it. Gotcha. I was like, you need like real shelves, yeah. and I was like, I got a like workshop full of wood. Let me make you some more shelves. Like, and we've done that before. We yeah. done like the natural, like this stuff, like the wood and your you know, your walnut. ink overflow in your office. Yeah, hundred percent. So I was like, I can build you some shelves. He's like, I know what it feels like, buddy, to have yep. too much of a thing. That's right. <laughs> so let's do it. So I made him one shelf already, and then I'm working on a second one right now. So nice. he's gonna have him some shelves, but it's gonna eventually his room is gonna start looking like, uh, I don't know, like a. a a warehouse because he's just gonna have shelves with Legos everywhere. But yeah. whatever, it's his room. He can do what he wants. Um, so that I'm in the process of working on that, and then uh, played Settlers of Catan with our kids, which I will say is a lot of fun. I love Settlers of Catan anyway. I've never played it. Oh, it's so good. I've, I'm sure it is. It's so good. So like, there's nobody that says it's a bad game. So yeah, it's good. It's good because and I've like I've actually read up on like why it's so good. Because it's like you said, like the pacing of it and all that. But like basically the game is designed so that it can't just drag on forever and ever. Like there is a a cadence to the game that results in someone winning within a pretty defined period of time. That's awesome. So like it's kind of designed so that it stays fun. I like that. For the whole time. Um, but yeah, my kids, we've played like the junior version, you know? So it's like we have junior Monopoly and Junior with this, that, and the other. And so Kiddos we had like, of Catan. Yeah. So we had like Junior's Catan. We had a Junior, um, what was it? Uh, Ticket to Ride. That's another good one that we love to do. But now my kids are old enough where they can like play the real thing. And I'm like, okay, okay. Because Rachel and I love that game, but we could never really play it with just us. And we have no social life, so we don't want to get together with anybody. So we would do it like with her sister and brother-in-law, but then like they have young kids. So it would be like, if the stars aligned and we visit, so it'd be like maybe once a year we get to play a game. But now that the kids can do it, I'm like, oh, we played like two games, two nights in a row now. Rachel wasn't feeling great. So it was just me and the kids, but even that was fun. And Ellie won both times because of course. I'm sure she's not a sore winner at all, is she? Oh, she was taking pictures of the board <laughs> and showing it around and flashing around. Yeah, she's... Was there a I mean, dance she's a, involved? She's a good sport about it. No. No, no, no. She's not like rubbing it in our faces, but she's just like very proud of it, rightfully so. Okay, she okay. Legit, she legitimately like, gosh, like freaking last night when we played, 
I was like, literally my next turn was about to win the game. And then Ellie made a move that took some of my points away. And then the next go around, I was about to win again. And she made the move right before me and won the game. And I was like, she freaking stole it from me twice. She's practicing for the coup. <sighs> She's going to do it legitimately. Oh, well, if she earned it, then. She's learning your weaknesses, I'll Brian. go willingly. That's fine. <laughs> if she bests me with, you know, legitimately, then. Well, this, Sounds fine. like a Ron Swanson moment, like carrying around your will, like to the animal or human that kills me. <laughs> That's right. They'll know That's what right. these symbols mean. <laughs> That's right. Oh, man. And then. Uh, yeah, we rang in the new year, uh, not with anything social, but, uh, you know, we popped some Martinelli's, so doing the sparkling stuff as well. Um, but we did what we've done the last couple of years. We did the Animal Crossing countdown. So there's like an Animal Crossing yeah. that has a, a whole countdown, and they have poppers and parties and music and all that. that stuff. So we did that with the kids, and they really enjoyed it. So we've done that the last couple of years, and I'm like, I guess this is what we do now nice. for New Year's. But, you know, we don't normally do much for new year's anyway so no it's fine. like our friends our friends have a big new year's party and I, I i like going to their house for parties i really do and i love everybody mm. that's there mm -hmm. but the really big ones like they do a big halloween and a big new year's yeah it, it just like you don't get to talk to everybody yeah. it's just so it's just a lot it's your introvert the, coming out yeah. well it, th there's that and then there's the adhd component where it's this the stimulus yeah and with me i react to overstimulation by kind of shutting down accidentally. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's a kind of a little bit of a coping mechanism because sure. I can either I can either focus on one thing or nothing. Yeah. You know, I so in those situations, I kind of find it easier to process by just kind of like going into sleep yeah, mode. It's kind of melt in the background a little bit. And well yeah. the thing is, well that and I just kind of like I can't really engage because it's so overstimulating. Yeah. So it, it causes my face to look like I'm not ha enjoying myself yeah. because I just kind of uh, shut down a little bit. Mm. And Shannon's always like, are you okay? Are you? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm fine. And I do that in lines <laughs> yeah. too. Like if I'm in a line and I have to, because I can't stay still. I can't, I, I, I need to like wiggle my foot or fiddle with something. Yeah. But if I know I can't, mm. then I just, I will, I will go into some form of stasis and I'll just like, Stand and zone out. It's kind of like looking at a magic eye, yeah. but with your brain. Yeah, and and I'll just like zone out. But then I can stand still for a long time and not be bothered by it. Okay, but in big groups, I, you're basically I, like not there. Kind of, yeah. yeah. And that's fine. Like, and I can deal with that. It's not a problem. It's yeah. just it's just how I've how I cope. And yeah. but it it makes it it doesn't provide a good sense of optics. You know, yeah, I it makes you. me look like I'm just being a stick in the mud, and I don't want to do that yeah. either. You know, it's like when I'm like working on emails or reading Slack or something like that. I always look like I'm mad. Yeah. Like the number of times that I'm just in my office, like concentrating on something and people are like, oh my gosh, is everything okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm literally just like trying to read. <laughs> yeah. It's either I check out or I break my brain by hearing a thousand things at once. Yeah. Cause th those are my two options. Yeah. That's it. You know, fair enough. So, yeah. um, so I just stayed home with Archer, yeah. you know, we just, you know, keep it easy. Yeah. That's cool. I'm in that camp. I just, I don't even, I don't even have, friends that have parties <laughs> I, I just what, what i can't wrap my head around is the people that stand in times square for the entire day wearing diapers to see a ball drop that's kind of crazy but you know i could see it's like an experience i guess like going to like a sports game in person it's like i guess so there's but an like, experience of being there but the sports games are unique right like so it's it's going to be like you, there's never going to be two identical yeah that's true all You're the like, balls dropping like you've seen them one you you've seen one you've seen them all yeah it's the same thing. Oh, that's a ball. It drops. There's a number at the bottom. Alcohol probably helps. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I guess so. If you're going to stand out there in the cold with a diaper on I all guess day, so, yeah. Get really drunk and that's eventful, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it, but that's fine. Yeah. Cool if you do. All right. <clears throat> um, yeah, that's basically what I've been up to. Nothing crazy. Cheers. For me, I guess. Yeah. Cheers. And Just creaking. Yep. Creaking. <laughs> I'll be doing that for a while, I think. I think the problem is like the creek is flowing so much now, like it's not going to stop no, for not like anytime most of soon. the winter. So like, I really can't work on it very effectively until it dries up a bit more. And I'm like, no. until the then it's just going to taunt that. you. Yeah. Look um, at me. I'm, I'm broken. Yeah. You're a failure. And there's so much ah. sand in that Creek too. Oh. I don't know if it's just like my neighbor that has the pond. If he just like has a ton of sand in there for some reason, but like, mm. I'm not joking. So like where the, I guess I'm talking about this now, but the, <laughs> 
like where I had that pipe, that culvert pipe, like everything had worn away underneath it. Mm -hmm. So I like ripped the pipe out and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not joking, within probably eight hours, the whole thing had filled up with sand. Filled with sand. So like just this sand just flowing in that water and just like any, all the other years that I dug, everything that's, it's just sand is filling it right in. And so I'm just like, I might go digging out this whole creek and then it just fills right back up with sand. I'm like, how much would that suck? So that's, that's an argument to be made for like, maybe I will do a bridge because I don't know if I do like some kind of more fixed culvert thing, like and try and like shore up the ground underneath there. Is it just gonna like fill up with sand eventually and block the, cul- like, am I gonna be digging sand out on my creek for the rest of my life? Mm-hmm. I don't know, I'm thinking about these things. So I'm just kind of waiting, waiting on that whole situation. I think the solution is to dam it up and make your own pond. <laughs> That's an option. <laughs> we haven't explored this yet. Uh, yeah. No bridge, uh, no creaking. Yeah. It solves itself. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> generally. And you get to it. dig so much, Brian. Oh my God. <laughs> Rich one digging a pond. <laughs> I mean, you joke about that. But I watch YouTube channels where like people do that. Um, it's a whole thing. And most of them are like, you know, like these people that have like trackers and excavators on their whatever acres that they buy somewhere in rural Tennessee or something. And then they like, well, I'm going to build a 10 acre, you know, whatever, two acre pond or something like that. And then like six months later on their YouTube channel, they're like, I'm fixing my leaking pond because I built it wrong and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just like, oh, that's But you wouldn't terrible. build it wrong. You could get yourself a oh, nice I little would, fountain to kind of I'm make sure, sure the water stays agitated. No I'm mosquitoes. Sure. I'm sure I would build it wrong. <laughs> I'm sure I would build it wrong. <laughs> See, the problem is you can't just like dam it up and be like, I have a pond now. No, you would have a swamp. You would have a marsh and just like, the mos- it would just be like mosquito infested. Well, and that's why you have terrible. a fountain. In where? Like the woods? Like in, the middle, creek, in the middle of the pond. This creek runs through the woods. I would have to like rip out trees and- That sounds like a, like that sounds, you're doing all that pond. anyway. Yeah, but like a lot of trees. <laughs> you're talking, this is in the middle of the woods. Okay. Trust me. It would be. We'll just dam it up outside the woods, like where the bridge is. The, literally, the whole the creek is in the woods the whole time. My whole property oh, is okay. wood creek. I thought the bridge was not in the woods. No, because I cleared the woods out where I made the bridge. Oh, okay. Like, yeah, but that's, yeah, no, it's, it's all it's That should all be the there. pond location. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to let this go. <laughs> it wouldn't be a pond. It would be a swamp. That's what would happen. It would just swampify everything. <laughs> And that's literally like where I need to cross. That would be the worst place for me to, anyway. So it would be so much more fun to build a bridge over a pond though. No, (laughs) you don't build bridges over (laughs) ponds. That'd be the worst thing I could possibly do. (laughs) Let me build a pond on my own property and then build a bridge to cross it. Yeah, that sounds awesome. (laughs) My gosh, bro. Uh, Anyway. I mean, it sounds like something I would do, but <laughs> not intentionally. <laughs> anyway, that's 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 my life right now. That's that. So um, we got one company update, and then we'll wrap this thing up. And I got fun facts about uh, New Year's resolutions. All right. And I'll put us on the spot to come up with some. Company updates. I think we're finally through the four-day weeks. We've had three four-day weeks in a row. I know. It's been so nice. It has been nice, but then also, like, I don't know what's going on around yeah. here. Everybody's confused. Yeah. I'm having a run and bound be like, okay, wait a minute. This is coming on on which day? You know, anyway. So now we're getting back to business as normal. Um, but we have a video, Hottest Inks of 2023, that we said was coming. Now it's here, and you should go check it out. And then we got more videos in the backlog that we're going to be working on. So... Get ready. We're not stopping. We're shooting some today as you're watching this, if you're watching it on Friday. Yes, indeed. Depending on when you're watching it, we may have already shot things. So, yeah. But we got to edit them, and it takes a while. Anyway, that's what we got for company updates. Um, We got to wrap this thing up. Let's do it. I feel like I got a burp, but it's like sitting in my throat, and I don't think it's coming out. Okay. All right. I want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us questions in the comments or if we post on Instagram or YouTube community, wherever we happen to do it. Uh, you can check yourlaypens.com for all your fountain pen, ink, and paper needs. Like and subscribe to YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, all these places. And I got some fun facts, Drew, about New Year's resolutions because that's a thing that people do, apparently. 
Yeah. Are you big on New Year's resolutions? I feel like we've done it on the pencast before. I did it, it. I did it one time when I was very confident that I could do it, and that was to replace every light, every stock builder grade light fixture in my home. This was like four years ago, though, and yeah. I did it, and I haven't done a New Year's resolution since because I don't have any confidence in myself. Okay. I'll give you one this time, though. Okay. Well, you already said you're going to clean up the Ben Gass room here. <laughs> That's uh, not a real resolution. No, it's though. not. Do you have a, do you have a resolution? I, I can give you one. We, yeah. we, we talked about um, <clears throat> uh, doing some dog training. Um, okay. Because we've got three dogs and we both work, you know, eight to five jobs every yeah. day. So w- multiple walks every day is just not possible um, yeah. with our schedules. We do our best with the dog walking, but they're not good on the leashes. And mm. they're not good on the leashes because of a lack of training on our part. Mm. So we talked about it and we're going to, by the end of the year, either ourselves or pay somebody to get the dogs better leash training. Mm. Um, we should be able to do it ourselves, but we're not going to compromise and we're going to get it done one way or the other, whether we need to do it or okay. pay to do it, because we will walk them more often if they're better behaved on the leash. That makes so, sense. Yeah. It's like anything else, practice makes progress. Yeah, right? and it, and yeah. we do it for them. Like, they they, yeah. de- they deserve to have more walkies. Gotcha. That's a good goal. Yeah. It's a good goal. It's worthy. Yeah. Um, I don't really have – I'm not big on news resolutions myself, but I feel like we've done that for whatever reason. I, I guess it wasn't – I don't even know if it was PenCast because we haven't been doing the PenCast but for a couple of years. But I remember being kind of put on the spot in videos where I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to like, I don't know, do more woodworking or whatever. And then like I built a workshop that year and it was like, oh, yeah, definitely did that. Check. You know, so I don't have anything like quite to the top of mind, but I was thinking like I've got my saxophone that I just got Mm -hmm. and I've been keeping up playing it regularly. But I will say I'm getting out of the honeymoon phase of like, oh, it's fun to just play. And now I'm like. Oh yeah, it's like work to practice and yeah. get better. And it's like Christmas time's over now. So like some of the Christmas songs I was playing, I was like, yeah, I'm kind of sick of these. And I'm like, okay, yeah, this is how it happens. Time to move on to some Huey Lewis. I mean, I'm definitely playing some stuff. I've busted out a little Bruce Springsteen and you know. Some... You could also do uh, The Heat Is On. Uh-huh. uh-huh. <laughs> Problem is like most of that that type of stuff. There's like a lick here and there that's like the saxophone stuff. But you just keep on doing it. Most of the rest over and of over it, again. Yeah, that's not that fun. Everybody knows it though. They're like, ooh, yeah. the heat is on. I've been doing careless whispers. That's what I've been practicing. I don't that know that one. one. Na, 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 na. It's like a big TikTok thing. Right okay, now, I believe you'd recognize it in a second. Cool, George Michael. Um, yeah. So anyway, I think you know keeping up with regular practice on the saxophone to like get back to at least get back to like what I could play when I was in my 20s would be fun to be able to like play it confidently play it you know regularly so I think like I'm not gonna be unrealistic of like I'm gonna play it every day but honestly like three times a week probably I think would be worthy and I'm I've basically been keeping up with that nice that's every other day more or less um and then also just cycling more like oh yeah it's honestly kind of been easier to like cycle and do the sacks at the same time yeah well that is possible not on the road but like I'm on the like trainer in the house that would really you know? scare the deer away that would be a sight to behold <laughs> let me tell you that would definitely scare the deer um yeah so i don't know just keeping up with that regularly but um did a little research so i'm always curious like what are the what are the top new year's resolutions of whatever the given year is go to the gym more um well Yes, right? that's always up. That's yeah. always up there. But that's not number one. It's not number one? No. So this is according to... Exercise is not statist- number one. Nope. <gasps> uh, according to Statista, which does all kinds of statistics and stuff. Um, so this was based on some surveys they did like late October. Um, you know, so whatever. For whatever that's worth. Um, most common New Year's resolutions among U.S. respondents who have made one or several more resolutions in the past. Number one was uh, to save more money. 50, oh. 59% okay. was uh, one of that. Uh, to exercise more was number two. Okay, so 50, definitely. 50% there. To eat healthier was number three. Okay. It's At 47%. Kind of the same thing. Uh, spend more time with family and friends was uh, number four. Uh, to lose weight was number five. It's a common theme with mm-hmm. all these things. Health. Um, to reduce spendings on living expenses was Health the, and money. after that. Spend less time on social media after that oh. and reduce stress on the job after that. So I thought that was kind of an interesting little mix. Interesting. Because normally you think like go to the gym as like the classic 
I'm going to do that for two weeks yeah. and then not, you know, mm-hmm. I'm going to sign up for a three year gym membership and then go for two weeks and then stop. Not that I've ever done that. Oh yeah. When we left the Chinese <laughs> restaurant last night, we walked by gold's gym and Shannon's like, yeah, we used to go there. And I said, but we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> we used to pay them that's for a it. membership. Yeah. That's it. Yep. That happens. But anyway, so that was kind of fun. That so is fun. Curious if, uh, I mean, if y'all are into resolutions and stuff like that, just drop it in the comments and let us know what you're up to. So, Or if you don't want to share, it's a great journaling prompt, obviously. That is also true. Yeah. You don't have to share it publicly unless you want to. It's interesting because I've done, I've read some articles and stuff on, um, I forget what it's called, but um for a lot of people, if you say publicly what your goals are, you're less likely to accomplish it. So tell us fake because, goals. Because then. there's a because there's a sense of you having accomplished it or worked towards it just by saying it. Isn't that weird? That is weird. That seems backwards. Yeah, it does seem backwards, hmm. but they've found that to be somewhat true. And I don't know if it's true for everybody. Me personally, if I say it out loud, I view that more as like, oh, I'm now accountable to actually That's what I've always thought. Yeah, but I don't think that's the case for most people. I think Mm. most people, they're like, yeah, I'm going to go to the gym. And they're like, yeah, I feel like I've done that now that I've said it. (laughs) Because last year, I think I told Bonnie that I was going to try to touch my toes before the end of the year. Yeah. And she checked checked in on me. I'm like, ah, leave Bonnie. Leave me alone. Of course, I can't touch my toes. I can't even get close. How far can you get now? No closer than I could at the beginning of the year. It hurts so bad. Probably less because you're getting older and less, less, uh, whatever, flexible. 100%. It'll be a miracle if I don't like injure something permanently. Yeah, I'm terrible. Like I'm I'm not flexible at all. No, not not at all. And I I did karate. I was in, I did military training, stuff like that. Like it never helped. Yeah, same. I did. I did flexible. I did taekwondo for years. I I was, it never, I was never could never touch my toes. Yeah. Rachel did dance for like a decade. She could never touch her toes. Okay. That makes me feel better. Yeah. Right. She was good at memorizing the choreography, but she was like, she reached a point. She was like, yeah, I'm not going to be a professional dancer because I can't touch my toes. Like no matter how hard I try, it's just not happening. I'm like, yeah, you were, that was a good call. You're not going to yeah. do that. Like I was never going to be a professional singer because I can't memorize words. doesn't matter how good I can sing. If I can't memorize words, pretty limited in my capacity. Yeah. Not that I ever want to. Oh my God, Brian, we're at 240. Oh, wow. Okay, well, let's end this thing. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We will uh, catch you on the next one and right on.